states. Uh, so this is like about five to six deaths per million um, you know, at this area. And then these are the three um, countries that are listed here, Taiwan, South Korea, and New Zealand. And uh, those you know, managed to keep death rates pretty low early on in the pandemic. So how did they accomplish that? Um, so Taiwan, they closed their borders uh, very quickly because they're close neighbors to China. Um, they used technology uh, in different ways, like tracking uh, people to make sure they stayed in quarantine, which you know wouldn't work here, but uh, that's something that they were doing. Um, and then they had a really centralized government response. And that's something that is a challenge for us because of all the states and, and the fact that states can have uh, different uh, regulations from each other here in the United States. Uh, so South Korea, they had extremely strong testing, tracing, and quarantining system. Uh, this is just the basics of a uh, pandemic response. And they were able to do that right away. And the reason that both of these countries were so well prepared was because they had experienced either the SARS um, epidemic or the MERS epidemic. So because of that, they had put the infrastructure and the funding in place to say, hey, we're not going to be um, unprepared if this were to happen again. Um, another kind of success story was New Zealand. Uh, they were very quick to shut down the country once they were able to see that first case come in. It just took a few weeks. They had shut down the country. And, you know, that's hard to do. It's hard to tell everybody to just stay at home and, and that's what you have to do. But the prime minister was so uh, proactive and she got on Facebook Live and answered people's questions and, you know, her toddler were, would interrupt her. So, you know, she was just very... Uh, clear and direct in her communication with her citizens, and that very much uh, imp uh, impacted their, their ability to have um, you know, cooperation by their citizens. And then finally, social supports. You know, they're telling people to stay home, and they're also giving that protection that, you know what, you're safe, you're, your home is safe, we're, uh, we're not gonna allow you to become homeless because you're losing your job because of the, lo the lockdown. So all of those things um, really helped to protect their uh, populations early on. So we quickly learned that social distancing was one of the mainstays to limit spread of infection. The number six feet seemed to be agreed upon as a critical distance worldwide. What was the justification of masking and six feet distancing? And did this really make sense? So to answer that question, uh, you have to remember what are the rules of transmissibility. And the rules of transmissibility is that you have to know how prevalent the disease is and how long were you exposed to and how close were you to the exposure. So basically, length and distance. So that's how that whole thing came along. So if you, if you, know, if you, if you all know, you all know this, but SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA virus, and it's respiratory borne. So initially, the thought was it's, it's spread by respiratory droplets. So they're bigger particles and shorter distance. And later on, we learned that it's actually airborne as well. So airborne means that it's smaller particles and longer distance, and it stays in the air for a long period of time. And the other thing we learned was in the, in initially, we did not know that this was an important finding because we did not know that one third of the patients were asymptomatic. And of those asymptomatic, 60% had SARS-CoV-2 infections and they could spread it. And 35 of those were pre-symptomatic individuals and 24% of those never developed symptoms. So that's when this finding actually transformed our approach to the infection and wearing masks. So that's when the mask mandate came along. Uh, so as Dr. Kadirbhai mentioned, um, you know, we had our masking. Uh, we kind of came late in the game with masking. We were, it was April uh, by the time that we finally got a recommendation that 
you know, we should be masking, there's a chance there's asymptomatic transmission. And one of the key reasons, you know, was that they were afraid that, or the, the, just the fact that there were, was a big shortage of PPE for healthcare providers. So this was just a reminder, you know, that uh, women in our community were sewing masks for healthcare providers. So that's something we hopefully never want to happen again, right? We want to make sure that our PP stocks are high so that we never have to sew masks for our healthcare providers, let alone the people in our communities. Um, and, you know, like the six feet rule, that was, you know, looking back at how that was developed, it was kind of based on um, studies all, all the way back in the 1940s, where people would take pictures and see how far the visible droplets went. So, you know, it was a little bit uh, based on things that weren't necessarily COVID, and we'll talk about that in the next slide as well. And then we also had the hand and surface hygiene, right? People were wiping down their groceries at one point <laughs> in the beginning of the pandemic. So uh, things have shifted since then. We, we want to think, or, you know, re we realize that we need to think beyond six feet, right? Um, multiple factors affect COVID-19 transmission risk because it's not simply uh, transmitted by, by droplets, it's also in the air, you know, uh, the effect, the air quality has changed. So uh, here, the, this was a uh, study from the British Medical Journal, uh, published in August 2020, and they basically did a critique of, of the six feet rule or the one to two meter rule, and they said, well, actually, it's multiple factors that go into this, you know. Uh, whether or not you're indoors or outdoors, whether you're talking loudly or you're silent, um, how long the contact is, how many people are in the area, uh, whether or not you're wearing face coverings. And then you might notice that there's uh, a couple columns that are very high risk, you know. So what, what is it that uh, is a really high risk situation? I've also underlined it. Can anyone say what would be a high risk, one of the most high risk factors? Ventilation, right? Poor ventilation. And was that something that we really talked about much early on in the pandemic? Is it something that we talk about a lot right now? Okay, that's good if you, if you are. I just, I feel like that's an area that we really can continue to improve upon because that's relevant for the common, you know, the flu, any other respiratory illness. Um, if you're in a small confined space with a lot of people, uh, viruses are going to spread, uh, but something as simple as opening a window can make such a big difference. So I really encourage you all, you know, in your homes or in your uh, offices or, you know, our, our, our jamats, uh, think about where we can improve our ventilation. And there's so many resources available on the CDC website. Um, I'm not an expert in ventilation, but there's so many resources that I think um, all of us can see where we can make those improvements to improve the air quality uh, indoors. So Dr. Qadir, working in the ICU, you've, been, you've seen some of those most critical cases of COVID-19. You showed us one case. And you also mentioned that the majority of these cases that we see are asymptomatic or mild. Uh, I think we've all seen that this has led society in general to take less and less seriously this virus and to lack respect for the infectious spread and the vaccine, especially in the US. And that's allowed the virus to continue to wreak havoc. How are the clinical features of COVID-19 affecting morbidity and mortality in US communities? So in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, this was the paper that came out from China. And they told us that of the 72,000 cases they had in Wuhan, basically, they said that 80% of them were mild to moderate disease. And 20% ended up in the inpatient setting, so they had severe disease, with a case fatality rate of 2.3%. Now, uh, look at Omicron right now, the case fatality rate is only 0.6%. And what they told us that the ICU mortality was about 20 to 40 percent. But we all know, people who have worked in the ICU, that once a COVID patient gets intubated in cytokine problems, their mortality goes up to 50 to 70 percent. And that's the reality of it. So 
The amazing part about this disease that it comes in two stages. One is that zero to five days. Like, you know, you get this upper respiratory infection kind of thing, like, you know, a common cold, and you get over it. Okay, fine, you got that mild to moderate disease. 80% or 90% of people do that. But then there are about 10 to 20% of patients who go through that second stage between the seven and the 20 days where you get this surge of inflammation in the body and coagulopathy with it. So that's what led to the severe manifestation of COVID-19, which affected every single organ of the body, you name it. We saw that in clinical Jeopardy, I mean, in uh, Jeopardy yesterday, we saw images of COVID-19 and affected every single organ. We saw the brain, we saw the, the kidneys, we saw every single one of them got affected by it. And the, vulner the, 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 it, the, uh, the, the patients that were much, much more vulnerable were elderly and people with diabetes and obesity. And now we know that unvaccinated people are much more higher risk. So COVID comes in, the post-COVID syndrome comes in two flavors, right? So one is people who got severe disease and they got uh, residual organ damage from it like uh, lung disease, renal disease, patient ended up on dialysis, oxygen, whatever that is. So that's the first kind. And now we're hearing about long COVID. So these are people who were at home, they did not get any severe disease, and 10 to 30% of COVID-19 patients who ended up with the mild to moderate disease end up with this long COVID syndrome. This, we don't know too much about. The pathogenesis does not explain, is not explained by the disease itself. And we're still learning about it. What are the, some of the manifestations of long COVID? Are, you know, extreme fatigue, shortness of breath, dysautonomia, temperature dysregulation, um, and this brain fog thing, which is like, you're never sharp anymore. Like, you know, it's gone, going on for almost a year and like their thinking is not as sharp as it used to be. So, and we're still learning about it and we don't even know where it's gonna end up. Uh, so, you know, there's the obvious uh, challenges with the individual, but how, how does this look like in a macro perspective across society? Uh, so based on recent data that came out of uh, the CDC, approximately one in five people have some sort of incident condition that could have been attributable to a prior COVID um, illness. So if you take the 85 million people who've uh, gotten COVID in the United States, divided by five, that's approximately 17 million people who have had or are currently have chronic long-term uh, illness because of their COVID infection. Um, in addition, long COVID is uh, now accepted as a uh, disability under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, and the Solve Long COVID Initiative has estimated that approximately 7 million people uh, cannot go back to their pre-infection func functionality. So they are, these are 7 million people in America that basically uh, have a new disability. In addition, there are economic implications as well. Uh, it's been estimated that one million people uh, are out of the workforce at any given time because of uh, long COVID conditions. And then finally, uh, based on some of the costs from similar uh, conditions like chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, the, uh, and this was all from an uh, economist uh, who published in JAMA uh, just right now, um, in May about the cost of long COVID, uh, they cited that there could be up to uh, $9,000 in cost per patient per year to manage their long COVID. And that's the cost of the individual, right, of the patient, but this is a burden on our entire health system. Uh, there have been, and it's changed our entire health system. Um, as of February 2022, Becker's Hospital Review found that over 66 uh, health systems had started some sort of a post-COVID clinic. Right, so that's huge. Uh, that, that is a radical shift in our healthcare system and, and we're just getting started. I, I do wanna make one point, if you don't mind. 
uh, it's that this just shows that it's not, um, you know, it, it is imperative that we continue to try to stop COVID infection because we're essentially saying that it's okay for one in five people to get a new chronic illness. So that, that's just my little spiel in terms of um, the fact, just the fact that severe, we're not as worried about severe disease and mortality doesn't mean that there aren't long-term consequences from COVID infection. Dr. Qadir, COVID treatment has been a hot topic since the beginning of the pandemic, leading to significantly different approaches around the world. Uh, we've seen conflicts between scientists different countries, different politicians. Can you walk us through our initial treatment approaches and how they progressed? That's a tough one. Who can tell me what movie this is? There you go. That's exactly how it was. <laughs> <laughs> it was the perfect storm. This was not easy. Um, and we were heavily focused on severe disease. So if you look at an, an RNA virus, um, you see that what happens is you have this spike protein, it attaches to a, a, a protein in your body, it gets uh, engulfed by the uh, cell, and then it replicates and makes protein and then makes more viruses and comes out onto the cell. And that's what an RNA virus does. So what people did is they tried antibodies to, uh, to like, uh, to, block these proteins. Uh, we tried hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine as well, which increases liposomal pH in the, uh, in, the in the cytoplasm, so you don't get this process of endocytosis. Um, we tried blocking the, prote uh, uh, the protein making by HIV medications. Uh, this was the only uh, FDA approved antiviral We'll talk about that a little bit more. And then these were the steroids and the interleukin-6 and stuff like that. So we tried all that stuff. But there was no clinical trials. So we depended on what? Social media. And the information that was coming along was drastic amount of information. It was very hard to sift through what was good and what was bad. So in March of this year, of 2020 actually, sorry. In March of 2020, WHO came up with the Solidarity Trial, which was the biggest trial in the whole world. Actually, it was about 14,000 patients, 60 countries, 52 hospitals, and about 2,000 researchers were involved in this. And what they, what they did was they studied these drugs, the remdesivir, the chloroquine, the hydroxychloroquine, the HIV medication, interferon beta, all these they studied in hospitalized patients. And what did they see? None of these drugs were effective. So what are we doing now for hospitalized patients? Actually, when they come to the ICU and like, you know, they're on the ventilator, there's not much that works. We all know that. But what, do, what we do know is that if you treat them early a little bit, and like you get them early a little bit in the, in the severe phase, though they're in the hospital, they're hypoxic a little bit, you could do remdesivir, which the data is not too clear, but I still feel that there are much better and clearer data that is showing that if it's early, used early, that it does work. Uh, there's monoclonal antibodies that we know about, and there's convalescent plasma as well that blocks the targeting, that initial, like getting the cell, the, the, the pro, the, the virus into the cell, just as preventing the virus to get into the cell. So you don't get that inflammatory response. So once you get that inflammatory response, we're doing dexamethasone. This was a big trial, the recovery trial, if you guys all remember. That came out in July of 2020. That was from the British uh, Medical Journal, where they say dexamethasone at six milligrams per day for 10 days works well and decreases mortality. But what did we do? that we started using it in patients who were not even hypoxic. And actually, people started doing this as an outpatient. And the, clearly, the data, if you read it properly, the recovery trial said it's actually harmful to give steroids when patients are not hypoxic. But that's what ends up happening. And these are the interleukin-6, which we do it at the end. 
And of course, the adjunctive, came, uh, the th uh, adjunctive therapeutics, which is the anticoagulation, which came out. And as you saw, that like you know, when you get this cytokine release syndrome, you get this thrombotic effect, and we used anti we use anticoagulation to prevent that. So that's that's what we're doing right now. So um, social media has allowed us to disperse information in a quick and easy manner. We've seen. Uh, an abundance of social media outlets, uh, including Instagram, Facebook, even TikTok that I've learned. Um, what? Afua committees, yes. We have <laughs> plenty of those. Uh, but we have seen that this is a double-edged sword. So Zinabin, can you expound on what the country did well um, or not in our social media battle? Absolutely. So, you know, there's a saying uh, that goes, what's, uh, what's 10 times more uh, faster at spreading than the coronavirus and three times more deadly? What's that forward? <laughs> right? And we saw uh, yesterday in the medical jeopardy that we had, you know, crazy things being shared, uh, influential people giving their own two cents, you know, who'd never been to medical school or have a public health background. So we were dealing with this influx, um, and, and the WHO actually named this uh, infodemic. So this is the overabundance of information, whether it be true or, or in, you know, true or uh, not true, that comes alongside a pandemic. Um, and so, you know, social media was a key component of this. And different social media companies, what they do to make it more addicting for people is that they are, create an algorithm that creates an echo chamber. You know, things that people like, they just continue to show that same thing to them again and again. So if you're liking misinformation and sharing misinformation, you're going to get more misinformation. Um, and so the social media companies did try. Uh, they, they allowed people to, you know, this is an example of, um, you can report a tweet if you think it has misinformation. Um, and YouTube kind of tagged any videos that had anything to do with COVID and said, you know, here is you can go to the CDC or you could go to the WHO for more information about COVID. You know, that's great. These are great steps. But misinformation is, is uh, happening faster than we can get rid of it. You know, this is a, it's an industry, actually. It's a business. So they're going to continue going, and uh, we're going to have to do something about it, right? So how, how can we fight misinformation if we can't stop it? Well, similar to a virus, I personally believe we can vaccinate against, uh, in, uh, against misinformation. And how, how would we do that? Uh, so that would be the second one, which is um, promoting health and media literacy. Uh, what the, the main uh, way to do this is by teaching people how to critically assess health information that they may come across either through WhatsApp or um, on the news or you know, just through the grapevine. So what they can do is say, well, is this current information? Is this uh, credible? You know, what are their credentials? And that can really help them to say, you know what, this forward doesn't even have a source. Uh, I'm just going to let this go. I'm not going to forward it because I'm not sure if this is true. But if they have questions, the, the next step uh, that they can take is talk to a trusted messenger. And throughout the, the pandemic, and um, most recently a Kaiser Family Foundation survey, uh, in April, found that you know you all, uh, healthcare providers, doctors, uh, their child's pediatrician, are some of the most or are the most trusted people when it comes to information about the COVID-19 vaccine, for example. So you are trusted messengers for all your patients, and even if we're not clinicians here, we are trusted messengers, and we can share um, trusted information about COVID-19 to fight the infodemic. Uh, so how does this all look in practice? Uh, so I was involved in a project with uh, a county health department in New York, and they actually worked with community-based organizations. They um, recruited trusted messengers from different community groups, and um, you know, we worked with them, we interviewed them, and figured out what the needs were of their communities, and created a tailored, uh, culturally relevant curriculum for their community members that included a lot of these topics, you know, finding trusted health information online, um, asking questions to your healthcare provider, just basics about COVID spread and vaccines, and then also connecting them, you know, to resources 
uh, health information resources or uh, healthcare resources in their community. So, um, Zina, in one word, vaccines. Let's go. Okay, so uh, so vaccines, you know, a lot of the things I've been talking about are very doom and gloom. I'm here to say vaccines are awesome. <laughs> we, this was a win, yes, yay. <laughs> this was a win in our pandemic response. Um, this was our moonshot, you know, JFK said, let's go to the moon. Um, and we were able to, with warp speed, get these vaccines much faster than we would have uh, you know, in other times, you know, a process that could take up to 15 years or more, we were able to accomplish in less than a year, which is really incredible. Uh, so how were we able to do this? Um, the mRNA technology was ready to go. Um, there was existing technology and knowledge available, and we were able to, you know, develop that, uh, use, a, use the mRNA and, and get that um, vaccine ready. There was a hyper focus um, on this uh, specific goal. And importantly, the government sent financial support and raw materials to the, the companies or the organizations that had the brain power but maybe didn't have the financial resources to get this kind of a thing done. Um, and then also importantly, you know, there weren't cut corners. They didn't skip steps. Uh, as you can see, it kind of condensed things. Things happened at the same time. But, uh, you know, all of the, uh, the players involved moved at the speed of science, which means they didn't, uh, you know, base their decisions on political pressure, but rather, what does the science say? You know, is this really effective? Is this really safe? And that's how they moved forward. Uh, now the caveat I have to say um, is that we still don't have vaccines for our youngest kids. And so, you know, this is still a process that's going on, but this is a huge win. And in fact, um, the Commonwealth Fund estimated that just by November 2021, over a million deaths were prevented by uh, the COVID-19 vaccines. So again, extremely big win for during our pandemic response. So as Zena Ben said, this was a scientific breakthrough, actually. You all remember the November data, right, that came out in the New England Journal of Medicine with the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine. And double binded like, you know, controlled trials, 95% effectiveness, 94% effectiveness. I mean, can't get any better, any better than that, right? So, but then there was always a skeptic, oh my God, it was like, you know, in a double controlled trial, this, that, how is it gonna fare in real world? So, Israel actually did mass vaccination in their country. And this is what they published in Lancet in May of 2021 after they've like vaccinated 70 or 80 percent of their country. And what they said is exactly what the paper said actually, that it prevented SARS-CoV-2 infection by 95 percent. It prevented asymptomatic SARS-CoV-2 infection by 91 percent. Symptomatic COVID went down by 97 percent. COVID-related death, 97.5%. And COVID-related death, 97%. These are staggering numbers, yeah. you know? <laughs> exactly, COVID should be gone. <laughs> Co you should say COVID goodbye, right? Basically, that's what you should say. But. <laughs> I'm always here to give the bad news, right? <laughs> Yeah, so basically, you know, uh, this is the cases that we were having in the U.S. As you can see, we did have a, a, you know, a bit of a drop around the time that vaccines were rolled out, uh, end of November 20, uh, or end of 2020, beginning of 2021. Um, but then, you know, uh, later on into 2021, we saw uh, the emergence of the Delta variant. Uh, we saw a wave uh, subsequent to that, then um, kind of a uh, between the end of 2021 and, 20, and beginning of 2022, we had the Omicron variant, very dramatic rise in cases it was, um, from that. And then you know, we had another dip, and then most recently the BA2 variant has arisen, and um, that's kind of where we are right now. So as 
uh, Zainabin mentioned, there was another variant. So what happened? So between May and September of 2021, so we got the Delta variant, which was detected in more than 160 countries. Uh, transmissibility, transmissibility was greater than the Alpha variant, and the viral loads were more than 1,000 times more than the Alpha variant. But the key to this was the vaccine was still very active in vitro against Delta. But we were not fast enough in rolling out the vaccination. So what did they see? So again, when in Israel, because they had already done mass vaccination, and what, what they saw is that in Delta variant, they got their elderly people dying more. So then they measured the levels of what the immunity was. And what they saw is that in all these graphs, you see that it's all coming down. This is in all age groups, the immunity started waning down by six months. So that's exactly what happened. It was a waning immunity. And of course, we totally forgot about you know, COVID, so we started partying as well. And like you know, the crowdedness and everything, that was going on at the same time between May and September. So that's what happened in uh, between May and September. So then what came along? Booster. Booster number one, right? So before I tell you about booster number one, before I present the data about booster number one, I want to, I want to tell you that, that WHO came under great scrutiny because most of the continents, like except most of the continents had already rolled out about 50 to 60% of their population had gotten vaccinated, except Africa, less than 7% vaccination status. So before you're giving booster to countries where like, you know, there is uh, already 60%, they did not do that. So we'll talk about that later on, but this is the booster data. The booster data showed that the vaccine was super effective. Again, because we know that it works in vitro. So 90s, again, after giving the booster vaccine, after seven days, the effectiveness is exactly the same as the alpha variant, 95%, 96%, 81% effective in reducing COVID-related death and hospitalization. Great data, right? But then, what did we get? Omicron. Where did it start, the origin of Omicron? Africa, right? So coincidence? Unlikely, right? Because less than 7% vaccination status. So you see that the difference between Delta and Omicron, 50 plus mutations in the spike protein. And uh, Omicron, as, the, as you guys all know, the South African data showed that it's much more transmissible. 5% of patients needed hospitalization, 6% death only compared to 24% in Delta and Alpha variant. So definitely less virulent, but much more transmissible. But the problem now is it's evading the immunity because the spike protein has dramatically changed. So what happens is that you have an antibody that was created by the vaccination and now it's falling off. It's not being able to detect the spike protein and it's going through. And that's why you're getting uh, the, uh, the disease despite being vaccinated. And the problem is that it shows threefold greater reinfection rate. So if you get Omicron, that does not mean you're done. You can get it over and over and over again. So what's the data on vaccination on Omicron? So I'm gonna focus on Pfizer because we don't have AstraZeneca over here. This was a New England Journal paper that came out recently, I think in May or June of this year where if you look at this is the delta, delta bar, and this is the Omicron bar, okay? And the Omicron and the further ones, the BA1, BA2 that are coming along. So what you see over here is after you get the primary series, two doses later and two to four weeks later, the immunity is up to 65%, right? But six months later, although the immunity is waning in delta at 62%, in Omicron, it's going down to 8%, right? 
And if you boost it again, two to four weeks later, you get it back as where it was in the first, uh, uh, at the 67%. So if I'm a patient who is elderly, who is uh, vulnerable to getting severe disease, I take my odds, right? And the odds are 67% is better than 8% and not getting uh, infection. So second booster right now is recommended for elderly about 50, immunocompromised patients, people at severe high-risk disease uh, who, are, uh, who, are, uh, 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 who would develop severe disease. So at risk for getting severe disease. So that's what it's um, indicated for at this time. So where are, we, where are we at with therapeutics now? So we talked a lot about vaccines, and people who cannot get vaccination, for whatever reason, they have like an allergy and they have a contraindication. We have a monoclonal antibody, which is called EvoShield, which you have to take every six months. Um, this is for pre-exposure prophylaxis. If you are exposed, we have some uh, monoclonal antibodies, but none of them that work against um, the Omicron variant. The, if you are positive, for if you have a mild to moderate illness and you are at high risk of getting severe disease. Oh, we're gonna take a break for Shasta. No, no, no. Okay, we're back. <laughs> uh, slides? Slides? Hold on, hold on. Give me, give me, let me finish and then she has some thoughts as well. Then we'll finish and then we'll start. Questions? I know I'm sure there's a bunch. So it's okay, uh, like, uh, so what I was talking about was where we at with therapeutics right now, right? So we have pre-exposure prophylaxis, we have, we have talked about there's two things, there's a vaccination and there's this Evo Shield, which, um, which uh, we use it for people who cannot get vaccinated and uh, they, uh, you, get, you have to get it every six months. For people who get mild to moderate disease, who get COVID and are higher risk for getting severe disease, we have, as initially, remember I told you we were very focused on inpatient and severe disease, but now we have things for mild and moderate disease as well. So we have this monoclonal antibody. I'm not gonna even pronounce it because I don't know how to pronounce these, these, these ones. So um, there's uh, this betelovimib, and uh, that's the only one that works against um, uh, the Omicron variant. But we have antivirals as well, or oral antivirals now. We have Paxlovid, which showed actually 90% reduction in hospitalization and death for people who get uh, severe disease, who are, who are at risk for getting severe disease. Um, it is a protease inhibitor. Um, works like, it's like, you know, when I showed you the first slide about the, the slide about the mechanism of actions where we were using HIV medication. This is exactly where it works, and uh, it, pro it prevents uh, uh, protein synthesis. Um, the only problem with this is it has a lot of drug-drug interactions. Okay, so you gotta have to be very careful with, and like, you know, as you all know, our people with, uh, at risk are people who take a lot of medications. So there is a lot of drug-drug interaction. This one does not have much drug-drug interaction. It is a, a, um, RNA, a polymerase inhibitor, and, uh, but it's only 30% effective. It's called mol molnupravir. And remdesivir actually showed, the data showed like, you know, if you do use it in mild to moderate disease for first three days, actually works well, but you have to be hospitalized and you have to do it IV. That's the only way. And that's where we are with therapeutics right now.
Okay, so uh, clearly we need the boosters, right? Uh, Omicron is evading our immunity. So uh, where are we with vaccines right now? Um, in the United States, only two out of three people are fully vaccinated in general, just the two series dose or the one Johnson & Johnson. And of those 67%, uh, only 50% have received their first booster dose. So that's a pretty low uh, booster rate among those that are fully vaccinated. And again, we don't have vaccines available for our youngest kiddos yet. Um, so why is this happening? Why aren't people getting boosted um, if they've even gotten their full for, uh, initial vaccine series? So the Kaiser Family Foundation in April did a survey to ask why people weren't getting boosted. And the first reason was people feel like uh, they already have protection, right? A lot of people have already gotten COVID or they have already gotten their, their they had their uh, initial shots and they think that they have protection, which, um, you know, we know that that's not uh, true based on the data. And that's a place where all of us can inform our patients and, and correct that information. Um, the next most common reason is that they just don't want to get it. And the last, <laughs> the last reason is that they don't think they're effective. And that's because they see that people have been fully vaccinated or maybe they themselves were fully vaccinated and they got COVID, right? But we know that this, the, va the vaccine was never meant to prevent infection, rather severe disease and death, right? So that's another area where we can uh, provide that education and you know, correct that information. Uh, so let's go back to the just don't want to get it, right? What, what do you do about that? Well, that's indicative of, I think, a, the, probably one of the biggest problems we have with the pandemic response today, which is that we're just kind of tired of it. You know, <laughs> we're tired of COVID. It's pandemic fatigue. And I think that's a question that we can ask ourselves as individuals and also as a society. Uh, how much of what we're doing or choosing not to do is based on the fact that we kind of just wish COVID was over versus the reality of what COVID actually looks like right now. Um, and just a point, uh, if one thing that does work for people who don't want to do it, um, a lot of them do end up doing it when they are required to do it. So vaccine mandates do work in a lot of cases, just like seatbelt laws work, right? We don't want to wear our seatbelt, but we do because it's the law. So that, that, that is a strategy, um, a strategy that you can use in your practice is using informed re refusal. So if somebody you say, hey, you know, um, well, I see that you're due for your booster. Um, you know, can you tell me a little more about why you haven't received it yet? Okay, you know, that's a good, that's a good concern. You know, it, can I give you more information about that? Okay, yeah, all right, well, let me know if in a few days, if you'd like to make that appointment and we can get you scheduled. You know, so just having that uh, exchange can, can potentially really increase that booster receptiveness, you know, because we don't want to call people vaccine hesitant, rather vaccine inqui inquisitive, right? They're still trying to figure it out and make that decision. So um, on March 11th, the WHO declared COVID-19 a worldwide pandemic. Uh, that was 458 days ago. Uh, the U.S. has spent $4 trillion dollars uh, on this pandemic in several ways. So Zinabin, do we have control of this virus or not? I'm, I'm having trouble with the clicker. Oh, there you yeah. go. Um, so do we have control? Um, I'm sorry to say we do not. Uh, <laughs> the state of COVID today, as you can see on the left, that's the CDC COVID-19 community transmission map. And these maps are all available, um, the COVID data tracker on the CDC website. Uh, based on the case rates and percent, test percent positivity, you can see that a majority of the United States right now is at a high transmission level um, based on data um, from May 30th to June 7th, 2022. And then on the right side, you can see the COVID-19 community levels. So that's actually the, the um, community facing, like lay person facing map. The, the left side is, is more for healthcare providers such as yourself. Uh, so the right map, um, you can see it's, it's based on uh, cases per 100,000 people, new COVID-19 admissions and percent in patient beds occupied by COVID, COVID patients. So, you know, as the, the map gets more and more red on the left, you're gonna start seeing more and more 
uh, yellow and orange on the right. And um, the, the right side, um, the east coast right now is, is having some of those oranges, uh, the you know, north, midwest, and also the, the west coast. So um, that's the, the orange is when the, the CDC starts to say, you know, let's bring back those indoor mass recommendations because we're seeing uh, this impact on the healthcare system with the admissions and um, um, hospital beds. So what I wanted to um, talk about is how do we get rid of a pandemic? There's three ways to get rid of a pandemic, right? So either you completely eradicate it, means that basically you wipe it out of the face of the earth and you don't need to use any active measures anymore. Uh, or you eliminate it where like, uh, you know, you have to use active measures to make sure that, uh, that uh, the, uh, the uh, disease is not coming in. And in the last 100 years, in the US, we have been able to completely eradicate smallpox, which we don't even get vaccinated about it and we don't know anything about it anymore. But we, are, we have eliminated polio and measles as well, right? So we can learn from that. How did they do that? So for smallpox, everybody got vaccinated and it's contact transmission. So like, you know, you can watch somebody getting a post box and you will just contain them and it's easy to contain. Polio, uh, we're still vaccinating everybody and we're, it's oral fecal transmission. It's not respiratory borne. Measles on the other side is, we're still actively um, vaccinating against them and we're keeping it eliminated still because there is no asymptomatic transmission. What's wrong with COVID? How can we not do it? It's the same concept that comes over and over again. Like, you know, the issue is it's respiratory borne. It looks like any other cold and flu virus, right? So it's hard to differentiate what's COVID and what's not. And there is asymptomatic transmission. So we're not gonna be able to eliminate it. We're not gonna be able to eradicate it. The only way to do this is to control it. And that's what I'm going to leave Zainab Ben. It's on me, right? We're going to control this with all the information we're giving right now. Um, so uh, I did want to touch on the variants really quickly on the map. So currently we have, uh, we're kind of uh, slowly uh, getting uh, less with the BA2. Uh, we're having a majority right now of BA2.12.1. And uh, that's the 60, about 60%. And then we're seeing it starting to come in is BA.4 and BA.5. So those are coming in from South Africa as we're seeing this pattern continuing to emerge. So the variant, Omicron subvariant party is continuing. Um, so what, what can we do to control the virus, right? The vaccine clearly was not a one switch solution. And, and continuing vaccinations is also not a, a solution. So what can we do, right? So this is called the uh, Swiss cheese respiratory pandemic uh, defense model. Um, and so you see here slices of Swiss cheese. Each of them is something that we can do, you know, personally or maybe as an organization or as, you know, as a, as a society that can uh, provide some layer of protection against a respiratory illness such as COVID-19. Um, so that could be, you know, staying home when you're sick, that could be wearing a mask, um, that can be getting tested, you know, if you show symptoms or if you're exposed, um, quarantining and isolation. Uh, vaccines is obviously a key component. And you'll notice that all of these slices have holes, right? N none of these the factors or layers is completely foolproof, but when you layer them one after another, you'll see that there's some level of protection uh, for this person that's on the right side. And this is especially important for people who you know, may not have complete protection from a vaccine. You know, somebody who is a cancer patient, somebody who has a, a liver, a lung transplant. You know, they might be vulnerable to where they can't really be in society if they don't have all of these layers in place to protect them. So, next slide. 
Um, so just to review uh, some of the things that we talked about, we kind of did a, a SWOT analysis of, of seeing how we have done so far in the pandemic and, and what we can do to improve for the future. Okay, so, so some of the strengths that we had, you know, the vaccine development was amazing. Now how could we use that same level of focus and uh, resource uh, you know, allocation to you know, do something great like curing cancer, for example, right? Uh, we have the resources, we have the expertise in this nation, so we can, we can use that focus for something similar in the future. Um, and I wanted to acknowledge your contributions as healthcare workers, your incredible strength uh, that we've had in the past two years, and we need to continue to bolster you all to make it a su uh, sustainable workforce that we can reach uh, the next pandemic and, and have you all uh, be protected and, and not get burnt out and, and overwhelmed. Um, but we do have some weaknesses you know, that we need to address. And, and I find that a lot of those are kind of mindset shifts that we need to make, you know, whether that's you know, thinking about individual risk and protection versus collective risk and protection. You know, thinking about the fact that when we're wearing a mask isn't just about protecting myself, but protecting somebody else. Um, and then also reactive versus proactive um, approaches, you know, um, putting in those prevention strategies before people are starting to get hospitalized. And then also short-term versus long-term thinking, right? We want to think long-term in terms of preventing long COVID and preventing uh, future pandemics from getting as bad as COVID did. Another thing that uh, we didn't get to talk to about much in this presentation, but, you know, we saw just extreme health disparities um, in the mortality rates, uh, hospitalizations from COVID, and that was because of existing disparities that exist in the United States. Um, and a lot of that is based on resource, uh, you know, differences in access to healthcare. So improving our primary care access and um, chronic disease management can really go a long way to improving people's baseline health so that we're not as vulnerable to a, a future pandemic or the one that we're currently in. Um, but we have so many opportunities. You know, we had the um, a rise of telemedicine, which really expanded access to things like mental health care for so many people. Uh, we have this mRNA technology that now we could use to develop so many different um, precision medicine tools. And we also, uh, importantly, need to increase and continue our global collaboration for things like vaccine equity around the world. Um, we need to improve our public health infrastructure, you know, uh, data systems, workforce. We really need to make sure that uh, we have those uh, testing, tracing, quarantining cap capabilities in place for a future pandemic. And also, I think one of the benefits, not benefits, but, you know, something that's really been um, made more aware across our society is, is the importance of mental health, you know, especially young kids uh, because of the disruption in their education. They faced a lot of mental health um, issues during the pandemic, as well as uh, healthcare workers. So we really have an opportunity to bolster that um, mental health, take advantage of the fact that people are talking about it now, and really do something about it. Um, and then finally, we've discussed these threats, you know, misinformation, long-term effects of COVID, uh, you know, those continued mutations, you know, they keep coming and also new outbreaks, new pathogens, whether they're in a, made from a lab or whether they're naturally occurring. Um, these are all things that we need to be prepared for moving forward. So that's the SWOT analysis. I think we're ready so, for So um, thank you, Dr. Qadir uh, Zinabin. We uh, want to take an opportunity to hear from all of you. Um, if you have questions uh, for our panel, um, or if you have comments about uh, something that was spoken about up here, um, I think we're going to we're going to try to have you come up to the front. It'll just be a little bit faster to get. Yeah, if, going if you could just come up to myself or Alifia Ben, and we can uh, get those questions. Certain regions in the world uh, who. Black vaccinations are more prone to uh, COVID infections. Uh, why, why should that be so? Uh, like Africa, um, Far East. Is there one other question? It said, uh, why are some places more prone to COVID infections? Yeah. 
I'm not sure about why some, some places are more, um, uh, more prone to COVID infections, but I think it's most likely depending on how you live. Uh, what, uh, like as I said, the transmission depends on three things, right? One is how much exposure you got and um, how, how the, what was the length of exposure. So the close proximity, the closer you live with each other and all that kind of stuff, and um, the uh, environment you live in is probably what makes it more prone to more infections than anywhere else, you know? I think that may be the reason, I'm not sure. All right, well, thank you for that great review. It brought me back to, I did the height of COVID in New York City in March 2020, so that it really brought me back to that. But this is not a question, but rather a comment. I wanted to offer everyone the pediatric perspective. I think you guys did a great job of, Omicron is so mild, this is so great, you know, it's so mild. But then when you look at the transmissibility, it was so high that a lot of our, you know, kids that weren't vaccinated yet, the pediatric hospitalizations went up so high because the rate of transmission was so great and we basically had no precautions taking place. So I agree, I think that's something that I wish we were talking about more here. Thanks for bringing that up. Thank you. And for, for uh, Pati, right. So, you know, we're all talking about the second booster now and there are a lot of people getting the second boosters. Uh, one of the questions was, was like, are we gonna, is it reasonable to wait for the bivalent booster from Moderna or should we be talking about that when we're talking to the patients? So that's a good bivalent, meaning like flu and uh, COVID vaccine together. Is that what uh, you were referring to? Yes. Yeah. So um, as I showed you the uh, slide, the last slide of the vaccine, it's 67% effective, but it wanes down in six months. Um, uh, the issue is, I think for time being, it is approved for people who are higher risk. Uh, but it will come in the future because people who have been vaccinated are already about a year out. So like, you know, the people who had the first booster was like, I remember mine was in October of last year. So my thought is that there will be a recommendation coming out soon that once the year hits, I think once a year will probably be available for everybody and six months for, um, uh, people who are more uh, higher risk. I think that's what's going to end up happening unless we're changing the vaccine and to a more, uh, the, the, the most variant that's going on right now, which is very plausible with we know that like, you know, it takes about one and a half year to just produce a vaccine now. A question, um, Dr. Kiderbe. So what is the defining criteria for long COVID in adults? Um, and again, uh, disability was mentioned uh, as it's a, so what are the requirements for that? That's my first question and attached with that is, so we are seeing long COVID from the alpha and the delta variants. What about the Omicron? Are we seeing any effects and how would you, would you comment on that please? So two questions. So first one, uh, the criteria for long COVID is basically uh, people who had COVID and they have these symptoms, chronic symptoms, like, you know, which are just not going away since they had COVID. They had, did not have this before, but now they're lingering effects from it. The problem is we don't know much about it, unfortunately. Like, you know, there is uh, the pathogenesis of the disease is not explaining the long COVID itself. It's like, I would compare this to kind of Lyme disease, uh, where like, you know, you have this post Lyme syndrome. It's similar to that kind of fact. And I'm not, I know like, you know, we laugh at Lyme disease, but people who are affected by it are affected by it, right? So that's the issue. And, but we don't have a good pathophysiology behind, uh, behind that. But the, the, the definition of it is basically lingering effects from it after the exposure of COVID and it's not going away. Did, did, uh, so yeah, so the, the, it is definitely positive for, it's definitely there with alpha and delta variant. The Omicron variant, I don't think the data is out there yet because it's just too early. So, 
एक्सपीरियंसी सेफी बुरहानी मेडिकल एसोसिएशन ऑफ अमेरिका ना मेड्स कॉन्फ्रेंस शुरू थे था गई काले गई काले पहले कुरान मजीद की तिलावत सी शुरू थे यू अने इना अंदर अपने प्रेजेंटेशंस की था कि जे सीएमई प्रेजेंटेशंस के वही चे कंटिन्यूइंग मेडिकल एजुकेशन के जे ना अंदर सगला डॉक्टरों ने लेवा पर इन अंदर पहलो टॉक डॉक्टर अली अकबर भाई शेख उसामुद्दीन अली भाई है हिस्ट्री ऑफ सुनाई नहीं यहाँ से आवाज सुनाई सर जी जी जुदर भाई सुनाई सलामुअलैकुम वाहमुल्लाह है वह बरकत तो आप सगला डॉक्टर शे शिकागो ना अंदर आगनो बेहतर प्रोग्राम थे रहो चे मोहल्ला ना तो उन शरीफ हम ना घना ना घना नाना गा माँ माय मायोट ना पासे कोमोर्स करी ना गाम चे वहाँ मोरोनी गाम चे वहाँ चे अने हम ना आ तमारों को ना प्रोग्राम में आवा पहले हम लोग के सहेत ना मोला ना अपनी हजरत इमामी या नूरानी या में गयो तो आ कागज में हम लोग के सहेत ना ने आखवा में आयो तो आ के आ मिसल में बेड इन्नो प्रोग्राम चे तो आ प्रोग्राम वास्ते मोला ना ये सगला शाम जितना शामिल थे या चे ये सगला ना हकमा दुआ मुबारक सफलकर्मा विषय ये दुआनो पे पेगान हम लोग के सहेत ना तब में सगला ने पहुंचो जाऊँचो ये बाद मुमिनी ना मकानो महिया शायद वीस घर भी नए नए चें घर घर इतना नाना गांव में मोला मुमिनी ने देखवाने यहाँ ना हालात सगलू देखवाने मुमी ने नहवाजू वाने पर घंटा रचे तब तब ना सगला ने भी वो अम्मी छे घना वापस सी खास सचन नॉर्थ अमेरिका ना अंदर ने एक एक गांव ना शिक्का गोशे हमना घने हमना भी सगला रिसेंटली भी आरस करवाने आया था कि मोला ना ने घनी तैयारी ना साथ है कि शिशी एक इनकाब को मां मोहरम था ही इशाअल्लाह होता आला ये मिसल लॉस एंजेलिस भी आया था यूनिवर्सिटी भी आया था घनी शीता भी सगला तमना सगला नहीं मुमीनी मोह बटना लोगों शो सगला नहीं उम्मीद था ही था हम लोग के सहेत ना तमे आपता हो ये रजात हो जा जाओ क्योंकि हमने मोला मुमीन ना मकानों में कदम तंदरम होवा से पर धरेश है उड़ा तमा सगलानो जा प्रोग्राम शे ये कामयाब था ही अने जे रीजन सी जे गोल सी आ प्रोग्राम था है वो तो खास मारी दी दिली दो होवा शे अने हम लोग के सहेत ना ने इनवाइट की दा इसीसीसीसीसन पेश के दो ये ना वास्ते भी तहे जैसी शुक्र गुजार शुक्र जो अखोस प्रोग्राम में भी बेचे तो हमने भी घनों फाइट दो ठाई हम अगर टाइम ना ये ये सब सी ये शामिल ये इम्कान कोई अगर आइन दा ठाई छेले दो हवा करूं कि आज अगला प्रोग्राम ना ऑर्गेनाइजेशन मने छे याद के मुलाना दाई बना पशी पहले वक्त शायद अमेरिका पर न ये वक्त आ डॉक्टर्स ने ऑर्गेनाइजेशन कायम था यूटो आप सगला ने खुदा घनी यारी आपे जजाज़ा खेर आपे ओम ने खेदमत वास्ते ने तमाम इबादुल्लाह ने वास्ते छेले दो हो करे आप सगला ने रोशन चेहरा और देखने भी घनी घनी खुशी था यहाँ से मौलानी उम्रे शरीफ ने खुदा ताला क्या मत निलग दराज अने दरहरास करे वो आखर दावाना अने अल्हम्दुलिल्लाह है रब्बल आलमीन। Hope to see you all soon. अमीन शास, अमीन शास। दो। मुक्तसर मारस करे शास। दो। सगला साहेबों ने मुबारक बारी आरस करी है। Uh, can we have the uh, COVID panelists back up on the stand, please? And we will continue that question and answer session.
તો આ જે વેક્સિન ઇફેક્ટિવનેસનું જે આપણે સ્લાઇડ બતાવી ઇન દેટ ઇટ સેટ કે ધ ઇફેક્ટિવનેસ ગોઝ ડાઉન આફ્ટર એક્સ નંબર ઓફ મંથ્સ ઇઝ દેટ ક્લિનિકલ ઇફેક્ટિવનેસ ઓર ઇઝ ઇટ એન્ટીબોડી ઇફેક્ટિવનેસ દેટ વોઝ ક્લિનિકલ ઇફેક્ટિવનેસ કેમ કે ધીસ ઇઝ અ ટુ મિલિયન પેશન્ટ્સ ઓકે યા સો ઇટ વોઝ ક્લિનિકલ ઇફેક્ટિવનેસ ડુ વી હેવ એની ડેટા વેધર ઇફ સમબડી હેડ કોવિડ versus having had the vaccine is there a difference in what the rate would be at the same at the same time frame I, is having covid more effective in prevention future covid so so like like if you are asking if you get covid is that better than getting vaccinated correct i do not know the answer to that question okay. but because if if something is less virulent like the b1 strain is it better to get the covid i i i get i get what you're saying <laughs> but the issue is that like well, you know, we don't know the issue is uh, long covid too right so like you know people who get breakthrough covid uh is not spared from long covid that's right okay, thank you i have two comments from a humong perspective one is when you talk about the society cost we forget what it did to the cost and the lives of the patients who were already having some uh disabling diseases like cancer it was even true for other chf and all those patients particularly for cancer patients also we were very afraid about what it would do for the screenings because we stopped screenings and unfortunately i'm sure in the next year or two we will see that data that how many more patients got more breast cancer colon cancer and so on so that is one important thing and as hemank we were very proactive in telling our patients please go we were behind our hospital to start all this uh screening procedures and that as a group of healthcare providers i think it's very important to stay with the hospital and tell them yes we are facing a pandemic but please let's not forget what is important to save lives which we know we can that's one the second thing i wanted to point i don't know if there is you know any other hemank felt you know initially we were very good you know we were consultants this was not our disease we did care and then we found the thrombosis and everybody was calling us and we didn't know what the hell we were dealing with the other thing that came about it not only an infection which was very scary was the vaccine induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia it happens rarely but if anybody has seen this it is the scariest thing because this was with patients who were otherwise asymptomatic who did the right thing when got the vaccine and now they were really facing a deadly illness that we didn't know anything about it so that's something to keep in mind if your patient got vaccinated the platelets fell you better call the hemonk and get them started on something uh thank you so much for bringing that up and uh you know the excess death that's happened in covid-19 you know not all of it is attributable to covid the disease right it's because of missed screenings it's because of elected procedures that weren't uh able to be uh conducted it's because of uh, hospital beds that were full right so that excess mortality is something that we didn't even cover here so thank you so much for bringing that up um so this is kind of a uh, two separate questions one for dr kadir bhai um you mentioned paxlovid as kind of a post exposure uh treatment i know the us government has uh, invested a lot of money in it and it's being you know pretty widely prescribed um but there's a thing coming out right now about paxlovid uh rebound or breakthrough uh can you speak that about that a bit please so um it's a it's a thing but it is uh there is data that uh, it shows a rebound effect um where uh, what happens is you test negative after about five days or so of taking plaxlovid and then you get between day 8 and 10 you get positive again and last for about 3 days so uh but does it make you more transmissible during that time we don't know about that data yet but yes there is some it is very rare so far at least I just want to take this moment to thank Zainab Ben um and her team uh that Mufadda Bai mentioned about a document that SBMA had published to Jamaat across the USA about guidance on how to reopen masajid and majalis and mashahid at the time of COVID and Zainab Ben and her team which is uh, I think Asma Ben uh, Ghulam Hussain and then uh Jamila Ben Raja 
those, all MPHs, right? Um, they, they did the core of the work and, and, and created such a robust document with guidances on exactly how and in, in the safest way and it really helped in Ramadan the year before last on how that we can safely open and the statistics speak for themselves in the sense that we had very, 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 very few cases of COVID during those times. So thank you for that. So uh, just to end on a positive note, uh, I would like to give uh, Dr. Qadir and uh, Zainab in a moment to just give some final thoughts. So my last thoughts uh, before I leave, um, this pandemic really shocked the medical and scientific society um, with its unique characteristics and uh, brutal um, way of transmission morbidity and mortality. Yet, it did show um, the importance of robust science, innovative treatment measures at multiple levels, and the resilience and dedication of the frontline workers, uh, medical and non-medical workers as well. But the one last thing I do want to mention is to get control of this disease it has to be a global uh, response. It's not gonna work by just being America because there is no borders anymore. Um, first, I just wanted to say I'm very thankful for the, the opportunity for the Kidmat uh, that was bestowed upon me. So uh, just really grateful for this opportunity to help support uh, your work. Um, I wanted to just end by saying uh, that you know, we, we have tried and tested measures. You know, many countries learned from their past experiences with pandemics. So this is our opportunity to do the same. And this is you know, personal for all of us, right? We have our kids, my, my daughter was born in January of 2020. So you can imagine you know, this has been her entire life. And so that really motivates me to say, well, what can we do for our kids to have a more pandemic resilient future? So I hope you'll take that um, and say, well, what can I do? Where can I contribute um, so that we have that to give to our kids moving forward? And again, very thankful, Shukur uh, Guzar, for the opportunity for Kidmat. And uh, you know, it, it's thanks to our trusted messenger, Sayyidina Mufadda Sefudin Mola, that we have been safe and protected throughout this pandemic. So, Kudata uh, Mola, Dola Amir Sharif, Umar Sharif, and Taroze Kayamad Daraz and Daraz Kare. Amen. Dr. Khadir Rai and uh, Zina Bin, we want to thank you very much for all the time you've put in in preparation. I know there were many, many conference calls late at night, so appreciate all your work in preparing this. Thank you, Dr. Mufadil. Thank you. He, he, he so, made this happen. That's right. So thank you, Dr. Mufadil. <laughs> so um, moving along up next, uh, we would like to thank one of our... us to achieve this fight against the pandemic. So uh, up next, uh, we want to thank uh, Sheikh Mohammad Libai Milwala and DM Clinical Research. Uh, for their sponsorship. Uh, they have been sponsors of SBMA for our last conference and also this conference, and there's a short video presenting their um, uh, company.
So now we just take, we're gonna take two minutes uh, for everyone who is, uh, to, that needs the CME credit to just go on that link please. And we'll just do it right now, two minutes to do the post survey. And inshallah then we'll start the next um, speaker. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Awaras Ashara Mubarakani Wazma Akamola Tawala Umru Sharifila Yamidinya Molana Ali Alayhi Salamna Kala Mubarakma Si Barakat Lane Bayan for Mayu. Ehma Molana Ali Alayhi Salam for Maweche Talabato Salamat Fi Vajato Fi Ibadi. I sought safety and I found it in Ibadat. Huzur Allah has continually encouraged and exhorted us to maintain our physical health. Saying that in movement there is barakat. Harakat ma barakat che. One major reason for this is so that we can partake in the various arkan of ibadat in the way that we are meant to do so. To assist us in maximizing our physical potential, SBMAA is proud to present a CME talk titled a prescription for exercise, presenting Dr. Hujefa Wora. Dr. Hujefa Bai Wora is an internist who has practiced in the Arlington, Texas area for almost 20 years. He started his solo practice with his wife Insia as his business partner. In the Jamaat, he has long served in his medical capacity as the lead for many Jamaat medical initiatives, including recent, most recently Miles from Mola, as well as many health fairs, immunization drives, and educational programming. And he is the most recent, currently the head of Umur Sehat for the Dallas Jamaat. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hujefa Wora.
Perfect. Ooh, now you can hear me even better. So, oh, I'm going to mess with that for a second. There we go. All right. Cool. So, I have a very important job for you, Saab. Right now, I'm wearing my heart monitor. We're going to talk about heart monitors in a minute. But you can see it's in the blue zone right now. Oh, it turned green because I'm starting to get a little bit nervous in front of you guys, all right? So, Saab, I need you to watch this heart monitor for me. And if it gets into the orange zone, I want you to seriously think about shutting me up. And if it gets into the red zone, are there any cardiologists in the room? Have all the cardiologists left me? Good God. I'm in trouble then. All right. So, Saab, I'm leaving this right here for you. I just went into the green zone. That's not good. All right. So, it's my distinct honor and privilege to talk about exercise with some amazing doctors. I've been here for two days, and I'll tell you, as the last speaker, I have been, I'm more nervous right now than you can even imagine, because I've heard and I've, I've been present at these amazing talks that all have all sorts of science and charts and graphs, and they're presented by just the most phenomenal, smart, intelligent, amazing doctors I've met, ever. And now you get stuck with me. Sorry about that. Where's my clicker? Does anybody know where my clicker is? On the podium. It's on the podium. Good. I'm not on the podium, which is trouble for all of you. Clicker. No lightsabers here. This is me being nervous too. All right. Am I getting into the orange zone, Sub? Okay, good. Down is forward. All right. Good. Perfect. All right. That did not work. Ooh. All right. So a couple of disclaimers. Um, because this is CME talk, I have to get my disclaimers out there. First of all, first and foremost, I have no financial ties to any organization, nor do I receive any monetary benefit, although I did try to convince Amir Bai that I needed to be paid for this. Um, he said I wasn't worth it, so sorry about that. So, nor do I receive any monetary benefit from discussing this topic with all of you today. In fact, I'll tell you that talking to my patients about exercise, when they take my advice, and they do every once in a while, and they do it right, it often leads to less money in my pockets in this fee-for-service and quality metrics world that we live in. So that's why I kind of needed the money, money I'm here by. Just a little shameless plug there. All right. I want to tell you all that I'm not a fitness expert, all right? I'm just a simple country doctor. My wife said for me not to say that. But it's true. My practice centers around preventative medicine, diabetes, heart disease, and I'm telling you, you all know, you all are doctors, we all went to medical school together. They don't teach you any of this in medical school. I mean, so a lot of this stuff I picked up on the fly. And somebody thought that it might be nice if I tried to share some of this with a bunch of important people, which is why I'm probably in the orange zone now. No. Okay, good. I can keep going. I've spent, on a very personal note, I've spent my entire life fighting the battle of the bulge. All right? I have always had a BMI. Anybody know what BMI is? We all know what BMI is. Body Mass Index. We're not going to talk about that too much further because I start to get palpitations. Um, but my BMI has always been greater than 35 my entire adult life. Most of my pediatric life, too. Some of these guys know, have known me since I was very young, and they know that the bulge has been there. Probably, my stomach was probably bigger than I was when I was six years old. I don't know how that happens. So, But what does, what has kind of helped me to get through this is that most of you already know, some of you already know, that I'm an avid cyclist. I'm a fanatical skier. 
I probably shouldn't be. Some of y'all know my my story, and I'm not going to go into that too much. But but I probably should quit skiing soon. <laughs> I'm not not go, not going to. I'm a terrible golfer. Some of you are like, that's not exercise. That's some weird game where you shove a ball around. Well, I tried to get onto the golf course, didn't work. And I'm a member of a cult organization. And this part of my disclaimer is super important. I'm a member of a cult organization called Orange Theory Fitness. Anybody know what Orange Theory Fitness is? Nice. Any members in here? Am I the only one? Shame on all of you. All right, sorry. I get a little crazy. I apologize. Whew. We're going to talk about that one too later. So when I started my own fitness journey, I'm going to we, we all kind of have this story. And my fitness journey actually didn't start with this picture, but I keep it up here because it reminds me of where I was and who I am and why I'm standing here. We all had this, we all, we've all had this experience where a patient comes into our office and says, Doc, listen, I need you to help me because I don't want to be a diabetic. I don't want to be this. I don't want to be that. I just need your help. Well, my fitness journey started about 15 years ago with a, with a patient that came to my office, and he said I could use his name, so there's no HIPAA violations here. I've already broken the law once during this conference. Um, his name is Rick Wilson. And we've all got a Rick Wilson in our practice, a patient that comes in, and they're totally healthy. They don't need you. They're walking in, and they're, they're Rick Wilson would run on a, on, a, on a normal, on a normal, I'd say run, he, he would bike, wouldn't he? This guy, when I met him, was 45 years old, which is a little bit younger than where I am now. And when I met him, he walked in and he said, Doc, I just need a physical. I don't need you to tell me anything. I just need you to check me out. And he said, that was kind of weird. Why would he do that? Well, the reason he did that was because he had, to go, he had to go on a bike ride. And he just wanted to get checked out. He just wanted an EKG and some blood work. And I, how much did this guy ride? ride? Well, he ends up telling me he rides meh, roughly about 400 miles a week at 45, all right? And at the end of our visit, he says to me, I'm going to come back and see you in a month. So we go, we go through that whole rigmarole. I, can't, I see him again in a month. And he comes back and we go, in all, we go through all of the annual stuff. We go through all of the physical stuff. We talk about his blood work. And at the end of it, I tell him that he's doing a good job. And he says, no crap, Doc. Let's talk about you. <laughs> Everybody have a Rick Wilson in their practice? So Rick tells me, Doc, I like you. I want you to be my doctor for years. But I'm going to tell you one thing. If you don't straighten up and fly right and take your own advice, I'm out of here. And you'll never see me again. And isn't that just a powerful moment for all of us? Because we've all been through this. We have patients that we want to get rid of, and we're like, Ugh. if he says he's going to get out of here and never come back, I'm going to be so happy. <laughs> but when Rick Wilson said that to me, it changed my thought, my entire thought process about what I was doing. Because up until that point, I was a medical student. And I was doing everything that I had been taught how to do in medical school. And I wasn't helping my patients because I didn't know how to. I didn't know what I was doing. And Rick Wilson told me that. And he said, I want you to be around. And he reminded me that we are perpetually medical students. Perpetually. And that I needed to straighten up and fly right and take my own advice. And not only take my own advice, but learn how to give that advice and what the right advice was to give. In that moment, I became a patient. And my, my patient, Rick Wilson, became my doctor. 
And I'll tell you that Rick still sees me today, 15 years later, and I, my staff knows that when he comes in, it's an hour-long visit, automatically. That's what my schedule looks like. Just block it off right there. Because it's my visit, not Rick's. I'm going to get the advice, and now he calls me Doc. We get called Doc, but he calls me Doc, and I call him Coach. Because that's what he has become. He's become my coach. And so when Maria, my daughter, where is she? She's somewhere over there. When Maria was born, this was somewhere, what was it, eight years ago? Are you eight years old? Yeah. So when Maria was born eight years ago, Rick said, you need to do something for me. And I said, geez up. <laughs> right? He said, you need to go buy a bike. And this was also about the time of, was, no, it wasn't, was it? Swami Milad. It, it, Swami Milad happened a couple of years before that. So I'm mixing up my story, sorry. But at Swami Milad time, Rick Wilson told me that I needed to ride at 100 miles from Ola. And I thought he was insane. But he told me what bike to buy. I bought that bike and I started riding. And when Mario was born, I remember taking this picture at the end of not a 100 mile ride. It was, I only got to 84. Because <laughs> it was 100 degrees outside. Anybody tried to ride a bike in August? It's insane. All right. So, whew, introduction. I want to give just a quick outline of our program today. And I know because I tend to ramble, we're not going to get through all of this. I'm already rambling. Um, so we're going to get through as much of this as we can. And I'm going to try to keep it a little light because, you know, I know a lot of you think I'm really serious. And I'm going to try to lighten it up a little bit, all right? The, a quick outline of our program, of course, when we're talking about CMEs, I have to give you the obligatory clinical scenario. I think I already did, but we're going to go through a different one. Then we're going to go back to medical school where it all began. And some of my med students are going to laugh at me and say, this guy has no freaking clue what he's talking about. And you guys out there who are like 20 years removed from medical school are going to say, that sounds pretty interesting. All right, cool. Um, then we're going to talk about some concepts of physical and mental fitness. Then we're going to get to some meat, discussing exercise with your patients. Then we're going to talk about setting goals for fitness. And we're going to talk about writing a prescription for fitness, which is the meat of where I want to end up. And then if there's any time left, which there won't be, I'll open it up for questions and, questions and maybe some discussion. All right? So let's see if I can do this. So here's my obligatory clinical scenario. All right, Sheikh Mansoor is a 45-year-old Indian woman male. My brother's going to kick my butt for this. With no significant past medical history, who presents to your office for his annual physical exam. And this is where I start to lose the specialist in the room. He has a strong family history of diabetes and coronary artery disease. Family history. He doesn't smoke, he doesn't drink, doesn't use any drugs. He's a good guy, he takes Tali, goes to Masjid 17 times a week. Um, you know, I'll tell you that the pandemic has really stressed him out. He's working from home. He's sitting in front of his computer all day. His activity level's kind of low. You know, he, he tells me I walk around the house every day and all the time. And, you know, occasionally I walk around the block. We've all had this patient, except my brother doesn't have that accent. He actually talks with a very thick Texas drawl, um, worse than mine. On your examination, Sheikh Mansour has a BMI of 36, which he doesn't, I do. Um, his exam is otherwise unremarkable. His labs show some elevated triglycerides. He's got a low HDL. He's got a high LDL. And his hemoglobin A1C is 6.1%. So he wants advice on what to do. What are you guys going to tell him? This is where I open up the floor. What's that? 
Diet and exercise. Bingo, flingo. I like that, right? Huh? Uh, yeah, of, course the, of course the surgeon in the room is going to say it's time to do a gastro. BMI of 36. No medical history. All right. Okay. That's what I'm going to tell them what to do. All right. So these are great. This is, this is great, right? What did I tell them to do? Well, I told them to move it, you know? Um, a good goal is starting, is doing at least 150 minutes a week, but if you don't want to sweat the numbers, just move more. Find some forms of exercise you like. Stick with it. Build more opportunities to be more active into, get more active into your routine. Sounds very reasonable, right? Right? And then what do you do? What do you do after you say that to them? Yeah, you move on to the next patient because, dang it, I, got I don't have time for this. You know, get your exercise in. But as doctors, do we really know what that means? Right? Do we really know what we just told our patient? Because that's the, that's the answer off the American Diabetes Association website. Or I think it's maybe, sorry, Amir is going to get mad at me again, again, but it's the American Heart Association website. All right? And, and that's the exact statement. We say it all the time because that's what we get told to do. But what does it really mean? Well, that's what I'm going to try to get into a little bit today, all right? So before we kind of go in, I'm going to get do about four minutes of exercise physiology. Please, someone wake Mustafa Bay up when we're done, all right? Please. It's not going to be four minutes. It's going to be more like two because otherwise uh, Alifia Ben will get really mad at me. Um, so skeletal muscle fiber, let's talk about skeletal muscle fiber for two seconds. There's two types, type one and type two. <laughs> that's it, that's all I got for that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's actually a lot more to that, but I'm not going into it. All right. So let's talk about the three energy systems of exercise. And this is where I want to get one of my medical students up here. Any medical students? All right. You want to come up here with? No, forget it. Uh, all right. I'm not going to rehash all, does anybody know what this is? The Krebs cycle. All right, 10 points for Gryffindor. <laughs> Excellent. So I'm not really going to rehash all of this stuff because clearly all of you guys know plenty about the Krebs cycle or the TCA cycle or the electron whatever chain, transport chain or whatever you want to call it. All right? um, I want to hone in on three areas of this, okay? I want to talk about the phosphocreatine shuttle. Does anybody know what this is? I can't even say it. I figured out how to say it about three weeks ago, and that was the end of it. Phosphocreatine shuttle is where creatine kinase splits inorganic phosphate, where am I on here, from phosphocreatine and then combines it with ADP to yield ATP and creatine. Okay? The phosphocreatine shuttle is important because it's your system for immediate energy. When you're getting up and you're going to take off sprinting, this is your system, all right? But it only lasts for about 10 to 15 seconds. I think this slide says 8 to 10, somewhere around there. Mine is well honed at 10 to 15, all right? The second system that kicks in is your glycogen lactic acid system, glycolysis, all right? More biochemistry here. Pyruvate, derived from glycolysis, is converted to lactate without oxygen, so it's anaerobic. Anaerobic, I got that one right. Yielding two molecules of ATP, all right? Lactate, which we're going to talk a lot about later, is moved extracellularly. It's buffered by bicarbonate, and it produces carbon dioxide, which we breathe out. Breathing. All right. Now, the third system, okay, sorry, glycolysis is important because it's your intermediate short-term energy system. All right? It's the system that, once you've started going, accelerates you. All right? Then we've got our third system, which is the oxidative phosphorylation system. And this is where, you know, you get the metabolism of gluco glycogen, glucose, fatty acids. All of this produces pyruvate, Krebs cycle. Pyruvate gets converted to acetylcholine. Forget it, dude. The important part of this is that 
Oxidative phosphorylation is the long-term energy system of the body, all right? And it produces like 20 something mole 20, 26 molecules of ATP per molecule of pyruvate. This is important because this is the system that keeps you going. Once you've started to run, this is what keeps you going for that long run, all right? So I want to summarize this one more time. We're all athletes, and life is an obstacle course. So as an athlete, which system are we going to target when we start to exercise? My answer is always, I'm, all, I'm one of those all or none guys, all, all. If you're running an obstacle course, you're going to get through the distance part of the race by engaging answers on the board. No, by the long distance part of it, the running distance. Oxidative phosphorylation, right? To, when you get to that steep hill where you got to run up and you're going to have to accelerate a little bit, you're going to use the glycolytic pathway, all right? And if you have to for all those obstacles in the road, which many of us have in our daily lives, we're going to need the rapid AP, ATP production from the phosphogen system, all right? That's about as scientific as we're going to get the rest of this way. All right, now I'm going to kind of get a little mushy with you, and we're going to kind of ease it up a little bit, all right? I want to talk about some concepts in physical and mental fitness. And a lot of these are my ideas that I've kind of developed over time with, with my, you know, taking care of my patients and being a patient of Rick Wilson myself, all right? Um, what exactly is fitness? Can anybody tell me what fitness is? What, is, what does it mean? What, is, what does the word fitness mean? I mean, we're always talking about, oh, we've got to be more physically fit. We've got to be more fit. What does it mean to be fit? Six packs. Oh, six packs. Like Homer Simpson right here, right? Right? So what Bicep is telling us is kind of the elephant in the room, right? That Homer Simpson on the right is not physically fit, is not fit, right? And I would argue, who said perception? 10 points for Gryffindor. No, that's, no, you're not on Gryffindor, are you? Slytherin. Slytherin, Slytherin. Yeah. Sorry, I don't have my sorting hat up here, so I forgot. Um, I'll tell you that fitness is perception, and it's, but it's not perception of everybody else. It's perception of yourself, right? So I'll tell you that I kind of look like that guy on the left a little bit, or I used to. Now I kind of tightened it up a little bit because I, sucked it in. And I want to look like, I think when I look in the mirror, I see and my wife sees the guy on the right, all right? <laughs> but at the end of the day, we know that neither one of those things is, your perception is not actually totally, it's somewhere in the middle there, right? Right? Please say yes. <laughs> Please say I'm not far left, all right? Oh, goodness gracious. It's a tough crowd. It's a tough crowd. See if I can get this thing going. Point it this way. I keep pointing at the screen. So we talked about this, physical fitness, cardiovascular endurance, muscle strength, endurance, mobility, body composition. These are all things that we think when we think about physical fitness. When we think about mental fitness, we think about being emotionally fit. Uh, my wife would tell you I'm probably not there yet, still a child. Um, we think about social fitness getting along with other people, or maybe not. Um, we think about financial fitness. And we think about, and everywhere you look, you see physical fitness tied to mental fitness. So I know it's got its own little category over there, but quite honestly, I'll tell you that physical fitness is mental fitness. They're the same dang thing, all right? Think about it, a healthy diet, regular exercise, enough sleep, all of these things are physical things that we do, and they make us feel better. So a little bit more science. I want to talk about how do we measure these things, or what kind of measurements are important. I mean, I can say, I feel good. I feel great. Uh, but what kind of things can we measure to tell us we're feeling great? I got this little monitor right here. And Bicep will tell you that I got down into the blue, right? 
which means I'm, now I'm a little bit relaxed. I'm kind of, I'm in the zone. I'm good. This is my happy place. But, so maybe I need to look at something like that. I don't know. Where does this come from? Well, I'll tell you that one of the most important predictors of physical fitness or mental fitness and endurance is the idea of aerobic capacity. It's a measure of how much oxygen you use when exercising in a sustained maximal workload. Think about this. The less fit you are, the less your aerobic capacity, the less your, the less your ability is going to be to sustain a high effort. If I tell you guys to run across the room, some of us are gonna make it really fast, and some of us are gonna make it a little slower. That's probably, probably gonna be me. And then some of us are not gonna make it at all if we try to run across the room. Because as we get older, as we get less fit, that aerobic capacity goes down, all right? In the, in, the, in the athlete world, this is not in the doctor world, but in the athlete world, they measure, they measure aerobic capacity with something called a VO2 max. Anybody heard of the VO2 max? I got these guys right. I love you guys. I'm staying right here. That's my zone right here. All right, good. So the VO2 max is something, basically, it's the, how much oxygen you're capable of processing per minute relative to your body weight. So milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of body weight per minute, all right? VO2 max is something that the athletes like to measure, and it, it's been shown it steadily declines with aging. And this decline actually is slowed dramatically just even by mild regular exercise. How do we measure our VO2 max? Anybody measure VO2 maxes here? We don't. We don't because you got to get on a treadmill, you got to put your patient on a treadmill, put them on a mask and get them running and start, it, it, it's, it's, a big, it's a big process. So we're, it, it's a difficult thing to measure and we don't really do it in a clinical setting. Pulmonary rehab folks do it. That's what I was kind of looking for. So the pulmonary rehab guys do this and super important. If you ever want to get your VO2 max checked, that's the, way, that's the place to go. If you want to figure out when you're going to die, watch that VO2 max slowly decline over time. Graph it out, you'll be dead by the time that VO2 max hits, a, <laughs> hits 40, all right? It's a perfect predictor. <laughs> did I say that out loud? Yes, I did. Okay, good. Um, uh, yeah, I know, right? Um, the second predictor of, of, of fitness and aerobic capacity, uh, uh, sorry, and endurance is lactate threshold. Lac your lactate threshold is the intensity of exercise at which lactate begins to accumulate in the blood fa at a faster rate than it can be removed. What the heck did that mean? We're going back to the Krebs cycle, baby. When, when, that lactate level, when that lactate level starts to rise in your blood, what happens? Well, it gets converted into all that crazy stuff and, and hydrogen ions are produced. So lactate's not really the problem. When pyruvate's converted to lactate, unbuffered acid, hydrogen ion, is added to the blood, okay? So acidosis is the problem. And biochem quiz, how can you tell when you've hit your lactate threshold? Anyone? Anyone? The pH change. The pH changes. But how can you tell when your pH changes? Man, yeah, the muscle aches, your muscle starts to fatigue. You can't just, you just can't go anymore. And some people throw up and do all sorts of crazy things when, 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 they, when they get acidotic, all right? So, so generally, the lactate threshold is a measure of how long you can go. So if you go as long as you can go for about 20 minutes and measure how fast you ran, what your heart rate was, what's my heart rate, sub? I'm good. All right, blue zone. Excellent. So when you, you can check that lactate threshold and you can exercise to that threshold and you'll live longer. Wow. All right, this is cool. All right, this is cool stuff. So my third predictor of fitness and endurance that I like to think about with my patients, and I'm going to tell you guys, I want to back up for one second and just tell you that when I talk to my patients, about this, this is what I talk to them about. 
This is what I talk to them about when I'm talking about exercise. I don't bother just telling them, you know, you need to exercise more. I say, hey, let's get into it a little bit. Let's dig down deep and understand what you're doing and why you're doing it and what you need to do to get to where you need to be. This comes down to something, I, we, something that the athletes call economy. And this is how efficiently your body uses the oxygen that it gets while exercising. It's kind of like a car. My daughter's yawning. I'm in trouble. Love you, baby. All right. So the, um, we, we talk about the efficiency of a vehicle, right? This is really simple. Economy comes down to how many miles per gallon your car gets. How many miles per gallon do you get, boss? Right, 40 miles per gallon in your car? I'm talking about you, at least. This is how far we get. When we talk about economy, we're talking about how, how far can we get? And how much energy does it take to get us there? So these are kind of the three phases we've talked about. I want, you, I want to try to remember these things. And we're going to move on to the next section here. Wait a second. There's a couple other predictors that I didn't talk about, and I just want to mention them because I know you guys are thinking it. You're thinking about weight. He didn't talk about weight. Did I, talk, did I mention weight, Sam? I didn't mention weight. And the reason I didn't mention weight is because I did. Remember that VO2 max is, your VO2 max is dependent on your weight. So the higher your weight, this is math for some of you guys, my medical students, VO2 max, as, the, as your body weight goes up, that VO2 max goes down. So if you're heavier like me, you're already running at a disadvantage on my little death curve that we talked about, all right? There's also waist circumference. Some of the cardiologists like waist circumference. It's a function of the weight, and that kind of translates well into BMI. And the cardiologists like to talk about it. I don't like to talk about it, so we're going on. And then my third, most, my third other predictor that I have mentioned, but I didn't mention here, now I am, is your maximal heart rate. Anybody know how to calculate a maximal heart rate? Nice. That is perfect. That is the beautiful answer. If I ever told my patients that, did everybody hear that answer? No. Sorry, let me repeat it. When you, you, tell, you tell your patient, I'm telling you guys, go run 100 meters, and when you measure your heart rate at the beginning, you measure your heart rate at the end, then you take 80% of that, that heart rate at the end, and we're gonna consider that your maximal heart rate. Did I summarize that correctly? Any of your patients ever gonna do that? <laughs> no. So I use a very simple formula that's total bull crap, but it's to it totally works and it's kind of the accepted way of doing it. 220 minus your age. So my, uh, my maximal heart rate is 204. <laughs> no, it's not. Sorry, it's not. It's, it's actually like 172 or something like that. Dang it, I'm getting old. That's the Alzheimer's kicking in. Sorry about that. Um, I want to go back to what I said earlier, because all of that stuff we talked about measuring, they're immeasurables. I mean, so for the purposes of today's discussion, physical fitness equals mental fitness. Can we mentor, me me measure mental fitness? Everybody's kind of shaking their heads like, probably not, and that, I think that's correct. I, there's not really a great way to measure it, so we kind of just do CT scans of the head and we see what it shows. That's what mine shows, except for the beer parts up. <laughs> so how do we talk about this with our patients? Well, I, I, I tell you that I tell all of this science to my patients. We talk about it, and a lot of this stuff goes over their heads. Um, and I try to simplify it, overly simplify it, because some of you in the room are saying, okay, that, that was totally incorrect. But <laughs> that's just, we gotta oversimplify. I oversimplify things because my patients look at exercise like climbing this wall. They're like, you want me to exercise? What the heck does that mean? I can't climb that thing. It's not gonna happen. I always tell them exercise is all about how we feel. 
How do we feel as we get older? Well, there are certain things that we can measure that limit our functional capacity. This, we talked about the idea of decreasing aerobic capacity. We talked a little bit about increasing body fat. And one that we didn't mention that bears mentioning here is the idea of shrinking muscle. Our muscles shrink as we get older, as we get less fit. And we kind of mentioned that a little bit earlier, but again, my patients don't always understand that. They don't care about what their aerobic capacity is. Exercise is all about how we feel. So I always tell my patients exercise is kind of a panacea. You know, it's, it's a cure-all. It's, everybody can do it. Everybody needs to do it. Even a low to moderate level of exercise can slow and even re reverse these effects of aging. So increasing our aerobic capacity, decreasing our body fat, increasing our lean muscle mass. Most of my patients don't care about this either. They're, again, we're going back to, they just want to feel better. So I always have to kind of tell them, so I kind of push it a little bit further. Let's talk about the risks and benefits of exercise. It's a, it's a simple way to go, right? We're treating a, treating a patient with something. We tell them a little bit about it, and then we say, hey, let me tell you about the risks and benefits of the gastric sleeve that Mustafa is about to do, right? He didn't hear me. That's all right. Okay. Are you good? Okay, good. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I mentioned your name. You didn't even perk up. And I talked about gastric sleeves, and you're, who knows? I don't even know how to get your attention anymore. So we discussed the risks and benefits of exercise. And can anybody tell me what the benefits of exercise are? What do we tell our patients? Again, if you just forget and can't think about it, the answers are on the board. Of course, they're kind of far away, aren't they? Hard to read. Some benefits of exercise, Chief. Uh, better sleep. Better sleep. This guy needs to sleep. It's true. He's been working hard. Anyone else? Come on. Better, some, some things that better. makes you feel happy. Makes you feel happy. Better, born and joint health. better born and joint health. Where's one fuddle by when he says that? I love you, brother. What else? Look good, feel good. We like to tell people it decreases your all-cause mortality, makes you live longer, live better, less chance that maybe you'll have a heart attack or a stroke or die of diabetes complications, something, right? We all know this. This is easy. I think they taught us this before medical school. This is pre-med, right? Maybe elementary school? I don't know. Um, and what, are the, what are the risks of exercise? Well, this is simple too, right? because the answers are on the board. Bus. Over, Overtraining and injury. Over injury. I get that all the time from my mom. Where is she? She's in back. Always telling me. I'm not going to. My joints hurt too much. We get, she's 70 years old, you guys, so uh, I'm picking on her, right? But we, have, we all have these patients. My right, this hurts too much to exercise. Doc, why are you telling me this? I got coronary disease. Where's Amir by? He's, I got coronary disease, right? What the heck are you, I might die out there. You want me to run a mile? You want me to run three miles? You're crazy, right? I'm going to tell you, and this is the only study that I'm going to, I'm going to, I've, I've shot on my board. This is the only study we're going to talk about today. Actually, that's not true. There's one other one, but this is, this is the only real legitimate one. The other one's fake. Um, it's a study done at Harvard somewhere. Where's Aliba? Ali is goodbye? He's not here. Oh, Harvard. Harvard. Love you. All right talking about the beneficial effects of physical activity on coronary heart disease. And you'll see that folks that are inactive, it's kind of hard to read, isn't it, Sab? Sorry about that. The, when folks that are inactive have a 12% risk of cardiac event, which includes heart attacks and stroke, heart attacks and arrhythmias and death and all the stuff we're talking about over there, all right? That's if you don't exercise. If you start to occasionally exercise, they saw that that risk went down to about 8%. If you got to a light level of exercise, that risk went up just a smidge, but kind of stayed right around 8.5%. If you got to a moderate level of exercise, and we're going to talk about what light, moderate, and heavy means in a minute, but if you got to a moderate level of exercise, you actually dropped your risk in half. Went from 12% down to 6%. 50% improvement is 
pretty darn good, don't you think? Would you guys take that? I would take that. I would take that. And then there's the folks that are crazy exercisers, the moderate to, to vigorous exercise people, and they kind of went back up just a smidge to about 7%, but still pretty darn good. I would take it, right? Orange theory. Who said that? Nice. That's moderate to vigorous. All right, we're going to talk about that in a minute as well. So now they care a little bit more, and we remember that exercise is all about how we feel, right? How does exercise make you feel? This is great. Let's talk about exercise and stress. You know, how does your body feel when you're stressed out? We talked about this at the beginning of my talk because I was a little bit tachycardic. If you see, I'm sweaty. Anybody see that? It's disgusting. Sweaty, palpitations. I threw up about three times last night, which my wife doesn't know. You know, we, chest pain, all sorts of weird craziness, right? That's what happens when we feel stressed out. And I wasn't physically stressed out, was I? I was mentally stressed out because I didn't want to disappoint you guys. I want to make sure that we got what we needed to get out of this talk, right? So again, mental stress is manifesting itself as physical stress. Mental fitness equals physical fitness. It's beautiful. Physical symptoms can increase your mental stress. You know, when you just don't feel good, you don't want to go exercise. My joints hurt. I'm tired. I'm yeah, I just want to sit. I just finished a 12-hour shift at the e in the ER, and I just want to sit in front of the television and be a vegetable, right? This is how the vicious cycle continues, because when you do sit in front of the television and feel like a vegetable, what happens? Do you feel better? Do you feel less stressed out? Do you feel like you're just, does, does it feel better? I don't really think so. I'm not, unless, Jesus? Vegetables. Yeah. yeah. Potatoes, right? You're, you turn into a couch potato, which that's another talk. That's a whole other CME talk. Uh, thank you for inviting me to that next one. I'll do it. <laughs> um, exercising is an effective way to break that cycle because all too often I tell my patients, look, you're tired. You just came home from work. You just did your 12-hour shift, doctor. I need you to go for a run. My, 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 oh, 15 minutes. I'm dragging. My, my, one of my buddies who's a neurosurgeon lives behind me, and he gets to be my fitspiration for a minute because he works a 14-hour day, and at 6 o'clock in the evening when I come home from work, I always see him running right by my, right by my house. And he always tells me, I'm going for my three-mile run. I'm like, dude, how do you do that when you just worked, you just stood over a human brain for 14 hours and did all that crazy stuff that you do? You've got to exercise to break the cycle. Physical activity releases endorphins. We're going to talk about that in a second. It relaxes your muscles, relieves tension in the body. And when your body feels better, so too will your mind because physical fitness equals mental fitness. Beautiful. I'm gonna take, I want you guys to take that home. That's all I want you to take home. Endorphins, the myth and the legend. What are, what are endorphins? Anybody know what endorphins are? Oh, they're feel-good drugs. Somebody said feel-good drugs. That's exactly what they are. Endorphins are natural painkillers produced in the body, usually as a response to physical or psychological stress. If you do, other, if you do a PET scan of this, like we did with Homer Simpson earlier, you, it would show increased levels of activity in the hypothalamus and the pituitary glands where endorphins are produced and released after exercising athletes. So endorphins are painkillers. They're natural antidepressants. They're anxiolytics, and if you see people that exercise like crazy, they'll tell you that they get high after they exercise. Serotonin levels, we're going to talk about that in a minute. I love that. It also has to do with those endorphins. 
Those endorphins get released, and we talk about runner's high and exercise-induced euphoria, which is where I'm at right now because I'm just, I'm ready to go, you know? Exercise, again, is all about how we feel. We mentioned serotonin. And this is, impo- this is, this is exactly what I was going to talk about in my, my, this slide. Exercise can treat mild to moderate depression as effectively as antidepressant medications. And this actually just came out in a study about two weeks ago that was on CNN, which some of you think is fake news. But um, it was a month ago, wasn't it? Right. Right. Sanjay Gupta talked about it. And it was an actual study that they did uh, at uh, Cleveland Clinic or somewhere like that. Or running 15 minutes a day or walking an hour reduces the risk of major depression by 26%. People felt better. They didn't have to take drugs. It's amazing because physical fitness equals mental fitness. In addition to relieving depression symptoms, what they also found was that maintaining that exercise schedule can prevent those of us who are depressed from relapsing back into that depression. So this is the crux of a lot of what we talked about, this exercise and cortisol. We think about the fight or flight sympathetic nervous system response, all right? When you're stressed out again, what happens? All of these things kick in. You're like me, you just want to run out of here and hide under a rock (laughs) because I'm stressed out, right? But what happens with exercise? Well, with moderate to high intensity exercise, the exact same thing happens. It induces a sympathetic response. Cortisol is released. when cortisol is released, it goes in the bloodstream, your blood sugars go up, your, all this crazy stuff happens in, in your brain, and your body gets ready to run and fly, fight or flight, right? So there's been a lot of studies on this, and I'm not going to quote a single one because uh, there's just too dang many of them. They show that exercise stimulation of cortisol production actually dampens that, stre- that, that stress reaction. So if you take somebody who doesn't exercise and you stress them out by giving them a pop quiz, which I'm not going to do right now. <laughs> but you guys thought about it. <laughs> um, that, that stress that you felt right there, that normal response, if I told you guys to go exercise, this is for my medical students again, you got a quiz coming up, you got a test coming up, what are you going to do? I want you to go for a run before you take your test. Because what's going to happen is that that stimulation of cortisol production is going to dampen the stress that you feel when you, get into that, when you get into that room. This is also kind of where physician burnout comes from. This is kind of a nice little segue into that. I'm going to mention it here because the stress of life, the stress of exercise makes life stresses more bearable. And that dampening effect is the primary way when I'm talking to my patients, I don't throw Zoloft at them right away. I say, you need to exercise because it's going to treat your anxiety, treat your depression, treat your PTSD, and for some of us, if not all of us in this room, it's going to treat our burnout. How do we write a prescription for exercise? How do we write a prescription for metformin? Metformin, 500 milligrams, PO, BID, with meals. Don't take it without meals, right? How do we write a prescription for exercise? Well, I would tell you that the way we write a prescription for exercise, summarizing everything we've talked about here, is we do it the same exact way. We don't tell our patient, hey, you need to exercise. Because who goes out there and says, hey, you know what? Your diabetes is, eh, your A1C is a little bit messed up. You need to take some metformin. I'll see you next week. Who does that? Do we do that? Why do we do exercise the same way? Why do we do it that way? We shouldn't. We need to do it this way, the way that we've been taught. So I have a nice little deal that I found a few years ago. What are these things called? Mnemonics, right? Something like that. I got my fit mnemonic. Everybody likes mnemonics, right? My fit mnemonic, which also describes our metformin, but here it's going to describe how we write the prescription for exercise for our patients and for ourselves. 
We start with frequency, F. F is for frequency. I, intensity. T is for time, and our second T is type. So frequency, what's frequency? It's the number of days. We're gonna tell our patient to take metformin twice a day, every day. If they're on trulicity, we're gonna tell them to take it once a week. We're gonna, if they're on Boniva, they're gonna take it once a month. Prolia, somebody mentioned Prolia a couple of days ago, right? Well, every six months, right? How often do we need to tell our patients to exercise? I tell my patients, I always recommend at least three days per week, starting. That's where we start. Consecutive days can be prescribed only as long as the patient doesn't require recovery. Because when you take a drug, what happens? You get the maximal effect, right? And then the half-life kicks in, and it kind of goes down and wears out. And maybe you get some symptoms or side effects, right? And then you kind of got to get your patient through that before they take that next dose. It's the same with exercise. You've got to give time for recovery from the medication, all right? This is especially important when we talk about moderate or high-intensity uh, exercise, high-intensity interval training, which I'm going to mention today, Orange Theory. I is for intensity. How do we measure intensity? How do we measure? Does anybody know what that is? Here's my little deal. Anybody know what that is? Anyone? It's a heart rate monitor. And I usually don't wear one quite like that anymore. That one is sitting, I know some of you guys are thinking it, so I'm just gonna say it, all right? It is not my butt crack. Thank you. I know you were thinking it. But what that is is my belly button because my heart rate sits right here, all right? My heart rate monitor sits right here, right above the belly button. Okay, good. Got to get that out of the way, <laughs> all right? Today, my heart rate monitor is right here. Because if I was wearing on my belly button, I'd have to flash you guys, and I just don't want to go there right now. So there it is, all right? How are we doing on my, on my, on my zone side? Oh, we're, still, we're still blue, so I'm still good. All right, <laughs> phew. I always recommend, it says usually, but I always recommend to my patients that they need to buy a heart rate monitor so that they can consider the intensity of the exercise they want to do. And I would tell all of you the exact same thing. If you don't own one of these little gizmos, they're easy to get. Fitbit, Apple Watch makes it now. Mine is Orange Theory, which is a little weirder, but they're really easy to get. You can get them anywhere. I always recommend that my patients get a heart rate monitor. If they're starting an exercise program, or if they're trying to get better, or if they're just trying to survive. We talk about time, all right? The time required depends heavily on the frequency and intensity of workouts. Obviously, if somebody's running 100 miles, if Rick Wilson's going 400 miles in a, in, a, in a clip, he doesn't need to exercise every day, and he doesn't need to exercise for any longer than what he's doing. What I always tell folks is that time is dependent on you. How far can you exercise? How far do you want to exercise? Unfortunately, the number one excuse that I hear in settings like this with a bunch of highly trained, educated, hardworking professionals is, I don't have time. How many of us have said that? Yeah, there's a lot of dang hands in the room. It's true. And for all of you that raised your hands, including me, I brought you the world's smallest violin. And it's playing a song just for you right now, all right? Because if you don't have time, you need to make it. Otherwise, your VO2 max is going to go down that curve, and you're going to run out of time. Make some time. So the most complicated thing is type, type of exercise. And that's really a depend on what your fitness goals are. You know, if you're working on your economy, then you're stretching, you're doing weightlifting, you're doing yoga, you're making your car engine more efficient, all right? 
If you're working on your lactate threshold, you want to live longer, live better. You don't necessarily want to be the world's fastest person, but you sure do want to get to the end of the race. Then I always recommend lactate threshold training. Interval training, muscle endurance training, distance running, swimming, and biking. How many bikers we got in the room that bike with me? Where are my bikers? Yeah. Where's the Z's? Where the heck is he? Oh, there he is. Nice, nice. There's my daughter raising her hand. I love that. All right. And if you're working on your aerobic capacity, because you want to be a, you want to be, you know, one of those guys that everybody at the gym hates, then you go for the long workouts, interval training, sprints, and jumping. Right? Those are the zones that we talk about. When we talk about mild exercise, we talk about economy. When we talk about moderate, we talk about lactate thresholds that we discussed earlier. And if we talk about vigorous exercise, we're talking about aerobic capacity workouts. So what did we do this morning? I didn't see all of you guys there. I saw a bunch of you guys there. This was this morning. This was our economy workout. This was us in our blue zone. I think Aziz was right next to me, and I think he, had, he saw my heart rate monitor sitting next to me. I got into the, managed to get into the green zone and stay there for about 30 minutes or so. I think I put that somewhere. but uh, It's all a matter of how you feel, but you've got to do something so that you feel better physically and mentally. Now, Hatimbai is somewhere back there in the back, and he's going to give you guys this handout, which is also a handout. I'm, I'm wrapping up. I'm done. Oh, it's sent. Oh, good. All right. It's hard to see from where we are. It's definitely really hard to see from back there. All of you guys have it on your WhatsApp group right now. And I'm not going to spend too much more time because I'm out of time. But the reason I'm giving you this is because this is something I give all of my patients. And you guys are my patients right now. It's a nice summary of everything we talked about. And it tells you what zones you're working out in. And if you've got goals, it tells you what type of exercise you're going to, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to want to think about doing. It's in your WhatsApp group, though. And I'll get it to you if, you, if, it, if it's not. All right? It's just a nice summary. And unfortunately, it's just really too busy. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about was strategies for improving compliance with exercise program, but I really think I'm just about out of time. So I'm going to just kind of gloss over this. The most important point of this slide really is that there are options. For those of you that are too busy, don't have the time, this is my violin right here. Use a work, work day walking routine. Exercise on weekends. Increase your times that you're working out so that you don't have to increase your frequency. Or increase the intensity so you can cut back on frequency work. You know, find somebody to work out with. That's what I did. I joined a cult. Um, exercise at home. You can, there's apps, all sorts of crazy apps on your phones. Or if you're crazy and want to spend a lot of money and think you're worth it, join Orange Theory. They're not giving me a discount for saying that. They should. So now what do we tell our patient? What do we tell Sheikh Mansour? I'll tell you Sheikh Mansour is not really Sheikh Mansour because my brother, if you guys have met him, is fit. All right, he's, he's an Adonis or whatever you call those guys, all right? Freaking hate him. Never has to work out a day in his life and looks great and feels great because physical fitness is mental fitness. What do I tell my patients? I tell them everything that I just told you. I wrapped this up into a nice bow for an hour and you guys were engaging and I loved it and I loved that I could share this with you. I don't usually do this in an hour with them. This is usually about three or four visits before they get me all wired up and, and going. But they all get this. This is what they get. So I want to tell you one more story, and this is important, so please don't shut the mic off. I just want to tell you one more story. 
Because about 20 years ago, when I got out of medical school, I couldn't do this. This is a 5K that we organized this year in Dallas, six months ago during the Miles from Ola campaign, which was totally amazing, uh, and spearheaded by SBMA. We had 200 per 300 participants. Salma Ben's nodding her head. Good. Correct me if I get this wrong, but we had over 300 participants who all walked a grand total of about 3,000 miles. It was crazy. And we ended it with a 5K. First time in my life I ever ran a 5K. If you'd have told me when I was 20 to run, to, to, to run a 5K, I'd have told you where you could shove it. <laughs> All right? But the thing that always, there's two things that keep me going. And this is where, uh, Alifia Ben asked me this last night when I was thinking about it. She said, what, what started you down this path and what keeps you going? Well, I'll t I told you guys about Rick Wilson and I told you about my, my daughter and I told you about my wife. I didn't tell you about the most important one. And I want to end with that. I want to tell you about the story that Shah Malakulash Tabaisab told me once. During Houston Ashura, who remembers this? We were all, a bunch of us were here way back when. Houston Ashura, when Burhan Abdi Mullah came to Houston. Most of us were, most of us were here. There were a couple, bunch of Houstonians that were here. A bunch of us worked the medical camp together. And Shasab asked me one day, he said, he asked me about my own personal physical fitness. And I thought that was pretty cool because Shasab's pretty awesome. And he said to me, he said to me, he said, let me tell you about what Burhan Adin Mullah does. He said, well, first he started by asking me what, he he'd, he'd asked me a few days before about treadmills, and what a nice treadmill brand was, and what to do. This was a couple of days before. But Shasab came to me, and he was talking to me about my personal fitness, and he said, so I took your advice, and we went to the store, and we bought this treadmill. I said, great. This is awesome. Good. Awesome. This was before I was on my fitness kick. But I told Shasa, that's great. You'll, I, mean, you're, I mean, you're running around already all day long, but you know, this is going to be good. And he said, oh, it's not for me. I said, who's it for? <laughs> he said, we're hunted in Mulai for my Uche. Okay, why is not bad? Abadu Tejai. After working his 12-hour shift in the ER, he said that earlier, he wanted to get on a treadmill. And he did. And at least in Houston, I knew about. Every day after Waz, he'd get up on that treadmill. And he'd spend an hour on that treadmill. I don't know how fast he was going, but I'll tell you, we all know, knew Burhan Adi Mullah. None of us could keep up with him, <laughs> whether he was on a treadmill or not. For me, these are, the, these are the stories that keep me going. These are the things that have kept me going to my cult, have kept me running. And these are the things that brought me here today to talk to you guys. It wasn't my degree or anything else that I did. So with that, I just want to say, you know, I want to say one last thing, and that is that I mentioned Burhan Adin Mullah, but how did Miles from Mullah happen? Miles from Mullah happened because Fadl Mullah said, Amalma, he did the exact same thing. He told us that we needed to exercise every day. And when did he do it? when we were in the middle of a global pandemic and we needed to hear, take your vaccine, stay home from the masjid, and exercise every day. These were the three things that I remember from the pandemic. And 
I'm going to tell all you guys, because you guys are my friends. I love you all dearly. Get out there. Don't do it because I said to do it. <laughs> do it because Burhan bin Mullah did it. And do it because Mufaddal Mullah has told us to do it. Get that exercise in so we can all live longer, live better here and here. Khuda ta'ala amara mola ni umar shreef ne qayamat lag daraz ni baas. Dr. Ozef Abai. We have Gun, two yeah, questions. We're going to we're going to get questions or statements. If you can come up, so I want to. Okay, we may we may not have time for questions. We don't. But I I want to say that was a very inspirational talk. It was a very informative talk, and it was a very entertaining talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you can't, you know, if it, the doctor thing doesn't work out, I'm sure like being a motivational speaker. <laughs> is there for you and probably very lucrative. I, I just want to be like, Moy, why, where is he? He's here somewhere. <laughs> but um, shukran for accepting SBMAA's uh, invitation to give the talk. Thanks and, for having um, me. Really, uh, we really appreciate that uh, you did this. Thank you so much. Yeah, Excellent. awesome. You. So you, you, we unfortunately, we don't have time, but Dr. Rujafa is always available for questions and discussion and uh, doesn't shy away from this it. It's beautiful. Um, so, uh, shukran. Thank you, sir. Okay, I am also a motivational speaker. <laughs> I am also a motivational speaker. Have a nice day. You have two minutes to do your post survey starting now. I also want to thank our EV people for uh, really making these mics work so well. Um, okay. Is everyone done with their post survey? I will be getting his CME credit. Okay, so um, we have uh, one more sponsor that I would like to thank and bring up to the, the podium for a few minutes. Uh, uh, Sheikh Abiturab Bhai Bakswala. Um, he comes uh, uh, to us, uh, we, we thank him for being a, a sponsor. Um, he comes with 30 plus years of healthcare uh, experience. Um, he focuses mainly on clinical research and home, high tech home healthcare. He uh, operates Avicenna Clinical Research and at home quality care. Uh, he will provide a quick review of opportunities available for physicians in the area of clinical research. Uh, thank you very much, Mufadar Bhai. Uh, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Uh, I just want to say that uh, my background has been in business. I don't have a clinical background. Whatever I look clinically, it's basically been through my forays in business. Uh, I did a lot of, started in the home health care area, was fortunate to do high tech home care. Uh, in the 80s, we were doing home blood transfusions, we were doing chemotherapy, so it gave me a great perspective. Uh, subsequently, I got into clinical research, and that's the opportunity I want to talk about today. 
a little bit about, uh, let me connect it to, we had concerns about, uh, or talks about fraud and abuse. Well, the two businesses that I do have, one has a particular implication. So if you go to the home health side, if you're making referrals in home health, and if you accept any benefit, please be very careful, that is fraud. So please be careful with that one. Uh, the only benefit you get is uh, oversight and home care. On the other side, clinical research, uh, thankfully, has no issue with that. The reason that is, is that one, uh, typically it's nothing to do with Medicare. Secondly, research is uh, commercial. Uh, basically, the ones we do, we don't take any grants. We work with the commercial uh, uh, pharma companies. So, and in research, per the F FDA rules, the physician signs the agreement, which is in the form 1572 that the FDA issues, that connects them to the research. So there is absolutely no jeopardy in terms of ac ac accepting compensation in research. So that, I just want to be clear, it's a great uh, uh, differentiation and that's something you don't have to worry about. Of course, you have agreements and all in place, but because you signed the form 1580, uh, 1572, where you're providing the oversight and you're in control as a principal investigator, then you are performing those duties and there is no issue with the compensation. What does research do for you? A uh, couple of uh, quick points. One is it provides you access to newer treatments, something that is coming down the line. Certain lines of treatment that are currently available may not be working for all patients. So this is available to you if you are interested. The second point, it's fairly helpful to the patient in the sense that if patients are compromised, at least in the United States because of insurance coverage, then research treatments are always at no cost to the patient. There is a lot of rules regarding patient consent and all of that, but research uh, does not have any cost to the patient. Everything related to research is compensated for by the sponsor of the research. That would be a commercial pharma. So if you're doing a Pfizer study, Pfizer would pick up all of the costs related to even procedures, labs, anything the patient needs pertaining to the study will be covered by big pharma. The other thing is that it also provides and can provide a fairly healthy stream of income for the physician. Uh, your time is valuable. Even if you do it with all the intentions of helping your patients, you still need to be compensated for your time. And research does pay well. Uh, on an average, it probably pays, it definitely pays better than the time you spend uh, on a patient that's compensated by insurance. So certainly that element is there. Uh, the model we use, we also provide the clinical research coordinators at your site, and that does free, up, free you up to see a lot of patients because the coordinator would administer the protocol under your oversight. Uh, you don't have any hassles about billing and collections. There is no bad debt in this, so when you see patients, during the protocol, uh, all the time is compensated and you don't incur any billing costs or anything related to that. Now, research can be done independently by the physician. You don't need a person or an organization that I represent, which is Avicenna Clinical Research. You don't need somebody like us. You can do it on your own. The only caution I have for that is that if you're busy in your practice, this does require a certain level of expertise uh, in terms of just managing it. And it's, my advice would be that it's better to partner with somebody like us. Certainly I'm plugging myself, but there's a very important statistic out there that when most physicians try to do research on their own, typically it's one and done. They will do one study, realize that, uh, you know, some of the areas that they need to focus on they just don't have the time to focus on. And they will find it as uh, quite a bit of a hassle and basically quit on it. So once again, I just want to end up here. Uh, if anybody's interested, please talk to me. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the minute and uh,
اور دعا چھے کہ اللہ تعالیٰ آکا مولانی عمر شریف نے تا روز قیامت دراز انہیں دراز کرے آمین تینک یو Okay, now for what is, in many ways, uh, one of the most important uh, sessions of this talk, um, the final session, we're going to uh, uh, leave the best for last, although it's hard to beat the 15 Homer Simpson slides that were just shown, so. <laughs> I want to call board members of SBMAA uh, up to the stage to join me. Uh, first, I want to take this opportunity to thank the various people who put this uh, into play. Um, volunteers and Khidmat Guzars, Mullah Hussain Bhai Ali Bhai, Mullah Ali Azgar Bhai Kapasi, Fatima bin Kapasi, Hussain bin Electricwala, Zainab bin Jamali, Maria bin Jamali, Sakina bin Punawala. If any of you are here, please come up to get a gift from Hatim Hard Work. I also I also want to separately thank and acknowledge Jorat Ashraf bin Musabai, who has been invaluable up uh, a lot of what we are doing here, and we thank her and her work very, very much. Please come up and see uh, Hatim Bai. Jorat Abin. Uh, please take a moment, if you haven't yet, to check all of the medical scientific posters uh, that we have outside. Tasneem bin Izzuddin, Batul bin Kaj Karbaidwala. Amtullah bin Fatehi, Daniel Bhai Abbas, Murtaza Bhai Kambati, they are really very good posters and take a moment to acknowledge their hard work. Also, we have art and photography displayed. Tasneem bin Shakir, Mullah Adnan Bhai, Ali Bhai, Hussein Bhai Fatehi, and Alifia bin Al Qamari, really tremendous talent that we have in our community. I want to thank the AV team, Ali Asghar Bhai, Yusuf Bhai, Yusuf Bhai, and Tukhum Bhai. Thank you for your great work. And of course, speakers and helpers who helped uh, with the presentation work, and everybody who helped organize, really. I want to thank the staff of the Hilton, and I want to thank the Chicago Medical Society for certifying us for CME. I want to thank uh, Chicago's Amil Saab and Chicago's Jamaat for hosting us again. And I want to thank Amr Bhai Saab for sitting through uh, the conference. Even though he's not a doctor, he showed a tremendous amount of support, and we felt the love and support uh, that he had to show uh, throughout this. With that, I'm going to open this up right now. Let me just take this. Oh, this is a okay, this is a very important part of the conference because in many ways this year we, we took our theme from Mola's Ashara um, Bayan and inshallah we plan to do that in coming years as well. But we want to hear from you the membership, what we need to be working on for the next year uh, or longer. If you have ideas of how we can improve this conference, if you have ideas about how we can better serve the community, if you have ideas about how we can better serve you, if you have ideas about how better we can better do Mullah's Khidmat, we want to hear about this and this is a great opportunity to get those things on the radar. So I'm opening up the floor now we have a few minutes, and I'll moderate it a little bit uh, tightly. Please excuse me, because I want as many people to speak as possible. But I'd like to open up the floor now to hear about ideas for initiatives, ideas for khidmat, uh, ideas for improvement over the next few years. Uh, Hatim Bhai, where's Hatim Bhai? He's going to be taking notes uh, and putting this into the official uh, minutes of this conference. So we really appreciate it. Make sure, please, you also give us your name when you are giving us your uh, feedback. So any comments are welcome. This is like open mic night. So any comments are welcome. All right. I am Alifia Malbari. I'm a pediatrician. I have two things. The first thing is I um, am thankful for all of your khidmat, and I'm really happy to see Dr. al Khamadi on the board. And I wonder how we can get more women on the board. So that's number one. Number two um, is I think this has been an amazing conference. It's the first time I've attended, and I will come back every year. And I wonder what more we can do for our students, even considering bringing the pre-medical students in, medical students in, and having sessions geared specifically towards them and their application process. So we can think about how do you apply to medical school, how do you apply to residencies. I'm, I'm very involved in my medical school, and I'm happy to lead those sessions next year. 
tremendous, tremendous ideas. Application help and, and bringing in the students. Really appreciate uh, that. Go ahead over here. Hi, my, sorry, my voice is gone. My name is Tasmin, I'm a pediatric resident. <coughs> Um, one of the things that I wanted to mention was something that was touched upon before about um, pediatric mental health, especially after COVID. And I think that's an initiative <clears throat> we can bring up in our madrasas and something that we can talk about a little bit more. Pediatric mental health after COVID. We've all seen kids, especially adolescents, decimated by social isolation, which has been really, really tough on them and really, really important. And your name, I'm sorry, Ben? Tasneem Hashim. Tasneem and Hashim. Okay, great. For Claudine Attar, Detroit, see, I was just commenting on what we talked about, the infodemic of wrong information out there. And somehow, if we can have uh, maybe a website, a blog page in which we put articles which are uh, appropriate, and if people, if they have questions, move in and have questions, we could answer. And uh, I would be honored if I could be part of that. Great, wonderful. Thank you, Mia Sab Sheikh Fakhruddin Bhai. We do have a newsletter that comes out and a website, but we have been a little bit remiss on keeping the website in particular up to date, and so we appreciate uh, that input. Um, Ali Isgar um from New Jersey, a medical student. Um, for you know organizing and setting this all up. You know a lot of us really appreciate it. Um, so ten or two things on that. I really enjoyed the uh, uh, working uh, the workshop on private practice and business entrepreneurship. And it would be really great to have something like that, a group where it could help people transition from their training into becoming real world practitioners. You know, out after leaving residency and things like that. Um, additionally. Um, Myself and a few other medical students of four years ago, we started a group that has now grown to about 30 Mumineen across the country that are currently in medical school. The uh, oldest ones of us are now in fourth year about to apply to residency. And it would be really great if we could somehow incorporate this informal group and turn it into a more of a formal relationship that we have with SBNMA, uh, you know, perhaps being you know, under the umbrella uh, of the group overall. Um, Absolutely, that's one of the reasons why SBMA is created, to create an umbrella and allow the infrastructure for groups like that um, to flourish. But we've heard twice now about transitions. There's a lot of transitions in healthcare providers' lives uh, from getting to medical school and getting to training, various stages of training and getting out. So that's really, really good uh, feedback that I think we need to take. So I, I was going to talk about transition, but on the other side, I've been practicing for more than 23 years and I'm Nafisa Burhani from Chicago, sorry. Uh, so what, what Nafisa Burhani? Nafisa Burhani, medical oncologist in Chicago. Uh, so transitioning from practice into retirement, I think that is a big deal because none of us know that we will be able to do it. And we need to start thinking about it five years before we want to do it. And I think there is a lot of wealth these physicians can offer the younger generation. So we should have a forum where people who are more experienced and are thinking of cutting back or what do we do? Can we give back to the community? So I think we need to think about having a forum of something sort where we can you know, bridge the gap, if you will. Thank you, thank you very much, yes. Uh, my name is Fatima Shub Chandler. I'm a fourth year medical student um, from Houston. Thank you all again, Kashukran, for your efforts in hosting this incredible conference. It's my first time attending. I, in 2020, after completing my first year of medical school, I was very excited to attend, and then of course COVID happened. So like Adi Asgar mentioned earlier, a few medical students and myself got together and hosted panels, um, you know, essentially creating, uh, you know, the conference components that we were most excited about virtually. And so I had the opportunity to host several of the Muminat physicians that we have present here who have served as mentors to me. And I'm so grateful to have had the opportunity to discuss with them things that I was keen on figuring out at that time and still I'm figuring out. And so again, especially in the women in leadership um, session, 
I was again inspired and reinvigorated by the words of these mentors. Um, and uh, there was conversation afterward on creating a WhatsApp group of some sort on Muminat healthcare professionals. Um, and there, that was actually one of the um, action items for the panel two years ago, which I'm at fault for not creating. Um, so now that's another initiative I would like to put forward and I'm happy to take the lead on is creating some kind of forum for uh, those of us here and those of us who couldn't attend to discuss you know, day-to-day -day matters and issues that come up um, and also provide advice and support to one another on advancing within our careers. Thank you and thank you for offering to take leadership on that. I don't know you've got her information. Yes. Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Burhanuddin Muhammad Ali from San Diego. Uh, I have a, an, an idea and also have a call to action. Um, I think we should have a session on FMB. And uh, the call to action is that FMB has, uh, again, is, is become an essence of our culture right now. And through that, over, over the past so many years, tallies have been distributing, have been, are being distributed, everybody's home, homes right now. But what I have consistently heard from many people including my own experience too, that the quality of the food, especially things like oral content and those kind of things, from a health perspective, the health quality of the food, you know, needs a lot of improvement. And I think as SBMAA, we, it is our job and our call to action to continuously educate our, 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 our jamaats and our groups and our folks, because what happens is that when the chefs try to make it more healthy, then, then people don't like it, and they say, oh, it's not as tasty, as tasty enough, the niari didn't have enough oil this time, and stuff like that, right? So it is our job to educate our population in our local jamaats at the local level to ensure that the population is kind of keeping up with what the chefs can be educated on. And I think that we need to do something more at an SBMA level to, to have some kind of sessions about that on how the local Umur Sehat committee members and stuff, you know, at the ground level can continue to educate the population to improve that's, outcomes. Thank you. That's wonderful, and that's a, a kick in the pants for the board, because at our last um, uh, conference, that was the keynote address, and we actually contacted uh, the, the person who gave that address to set up something like that, and then when COVID happened and we all became distracted, that fell through the wayside. So we'll take that on us and uh, we'll definitely uh, get enlist your help as we move forward with that. And, and I think uh, a full meat uh, barbecue with lamb chops and all that, you know, I think that doesn't quite bode well for SBMA either. Speak for yourself, that was awesome. <laughs> ben? <laughs> That's exactly what I'm talking about, education, educating the public, right? <laughs> ben? So uh, uh, my name is Lul uh, Dr. Lulu Hussein. I'm from Chicago. I was going to sorry. Say can you say your name again? Lulu Hussein. Thank you. From Chicago. I was actually going to say exactly the same thing. Um, that we really need to start educating a little more on low carb diets. Um, you know, less sugar, less ev less processed foods, less bread, less rice. Um, and if we are going to use rice, perhaps brown rice or black rice. You know, something with a lot more husk in it. Um, and the other thing is also exercise, just like um, the lecture that we heard, but general exercise for everybody in the gym, you know, especially perhaps in Ramzan. After we all go home, you know, take that 10, 15 minute walk. Um, and just to be able to understand, you know, how, how this is going to affect, you know, your, your, your ability to fast and just your general health, especially in Ramzan. And then also, you know, I remember the keynote speaker, Dr. Staff, a while ago, an absolutely superb talk on South Asian population, heart disease, diabetes. We are all, practically every single one of us is glucose intolerant. Most people don't know. We had all those wonderful initiatives, uh, especially in the Chicago Jamaat, of getting everybody vaccinated against COVID. At the same time, perhaps we also could have done everybody's hemoglobin A1C. One of, one of the things, thank you for your comments, really appreciate it. One of the things that you mentioned that I'll just piggyback on was that uh, in many jamaats, and I know at New Jersey jamaat in specific, they do weekly multi -set, multiple sessions on stretching and exercises for kind of the buzurgo and anyone who wants to join. But I know New Jersey does it because my parents who are in Washington, D.C. also take part in it. And that's been an initiative, and I think they recently did their 100th one. So that's a great idea, and I think on Jamaat levels that, that, that can be done by Umur Sehat to promote that kind of physical well-being within the Jamaat. And I just want to add one thing to that too, is that 
that's part of our role as an organization is in, in your jamaats, you are probably solving some of these problems locally. And so we want to help, you know, take those best ideas and best practices in each jamaat and try to scale them, you know, and try to, you know, uh, make sure that all jamaats benefit from all this innovation. Luluben, thank you very much for uh, your input and for your uh, suggestions. Uh, I, we have three people standing, Will, uh, and I think a fourth one maybe coming up. Uh, we're going to, oh no, three people standing. We're going to call it at that for time reasons. So please, go ahead. My name is Rashida Saifi, true pediatrician from New Jersey. So, um, I'm not going to talk about the health and safety program in the Madrasa. So, there are a lot of interactions with parents, and they are really looking forward to their doctors. Madrasa ma bhi a cheez continue rak ke hai. Jim school ma health sessions thai chhe, the nurse does it. For example, puberty no thai chhe, bullying no thai chhe, depression thai chhe. These were the three main things that parents came up with during these health and safety program. Jo sessions ki data. So they were lo looking forward ke apne pilla apna ma bhi to kar hai. Itle school ma, for example, fifth grade ma health sessions thai chhe to let them know about these things. So if at all up ne madrasa ma as doctors, maybe quarterly or uh, six monthly doctors a sessions rakhe, to ek to elogone apna doctors si khabar pare che ke sua chizo che, for example, puberty na barama, and bullying and depression, I guess ke ito ongoing chij. So I think we can contribute more towards better health of kids from that age itself. That's thank you very much. That's a couple of uh, two or three times now that we've heard uh, on a uh, greater focus on the youth of our community and our uh, generation, something uh, we need uh, to take to heart. Yes, right. Hi, uh, this is Murtaza Kambadi. I'm from Chicago. Um, and I just want to uh, thank you so much for all the events and the presentation. It was really great honor to be here. Um, I just want to echo on, and it'll be like a feedback on what Aliyah is going to and other, other people say it as well that we should like bring out more uh, opportunities for the youth and like the, the pre-med and the med students. So uh, in Chicago, we recently started off with the higher education and career counseling. So it's like a chain where we started with the pre-med students and those who have been like in math school, they're gonna guidance the pre-med and those who have been in residency, gonna guidance and counsel for the medical students. So uh, uh, we already have uh, Reza from our Jamaat and uh, Baisab. Uh, to start off with this project, so if SVMA can also participate, and you know, if anyone wants to join that uh, counseling session, or counseling group, uh, we are definitely uh, most interested, interested in that. Great, and that echoes what Sheikh Aziz by the point made before. It's one of the missions of SVMA is to take these local best practices that people are, are organically uh, developing and scale them uh, to uh, give fido to more mumineen. So we appreciate you uh, very much bringing that up. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Nafisa Gadiali from Chicago. I'm an OBGYN and a psychiatrist practicing currently women's mental health. Mm -hmm. And I want to first of all thank you, SBMA, and I'm really proud to be a member of this organization that you, you people have done an excellent job at spreading the health, awareness, treatment, everything. What I want to say is I think it is time we pay equal importance to mental health too, because it's beyond our imagination, the prevalence and what is going on in our community in terms of how many are suffering in silence. And plus, not just the mental health, but the substance abuse that we see in our, uh, in our adolescents and even the adults, which has gone kind of hidden and we need to do something. And my earnest request to SBMA to use this platform to come up maybe with a task force where we can do awareness, prevention, and treatment. I think this needs a very coordinated effort. Some of the communities, some of the jamaats are doing it ad hoc, but I think we all need to come together. Maybe we come up with a task force committee, come up with guidelines, and then pass it on to all the umur sehat in all jamaats and do a coordinated effort to save our youth and to help those who are suffering in silence. Just uh, to clarify, are you referring now to mental health or to substance abuse or both. use or both? Both. Okay. okay. All right. I think that's uh, really good. Now, what we're seeing here is a couple of themes emerge. Um, we, we, if I had to break it up, and everybody's comments are written down and will be reviewed uh, carefully, and you'll be contacted about them, inshallah. 
What we're seeing is transitions is one, one thing, both into various stages of training and, and retirement. Uh, we're seeing a lot of focus or concern about health, wellness, uh, and diet, and we're seeing um, scalability of local programs that we need to do um, that you're referring to, and we're, we're seeing concerns about our youth uh, and mental health and, and substance abuse. So if I had to sum it up, I'd kind of put it in those um, uh, four buckets. Um, I want to thank uh, everybody once again. I, I, in, particular, in particular, I want to thank uh, our working groups. We have working groups that are working on various ones of these issues, and if you're interested in joining a working group, please let us know. I also want to thank Umur Sehat coordinators for all the work they do in our Jamaat and for uh, liaising with us. Dr. Amir Bhai Sate, Marik Varsori, personal khas, khas, खास दोस्ती छे पण इना साथे मारो एक डिलेमा भी छे कि मारा खास दोस्त भी छे मारा कार्डियोलॉजिस्ट भी छे मारा डॉक्टर भी छे आणि ए इना साथे डिस्कशन न मॅक्सिमम स्ट्रेस भी आवे छे अपना अपना भी जेवारे डॉक्टर ये कयु के या एसबीएम न वा लॉस एंजेलिस न न में मिलेला आणि डॉक्टर किदू के ऐसा ऐसा प्रोग्राम छे अब जरूर आवजो एना अंदर से तो पहला मारो इनिशियल थॉट हतो कि हां एसबीएम एनु छे गनु अच्छू छे अपने सपोर्ट करिए पण मैं कॉन्फ्रेंस में जाने करी सु मैं क्यों क्या डॉक्टर जो सगला बात कर से टेक्निकल टर्म्स में बात कर से कहीं समझ नहीं पड़े पर अपने जाने कर सु सु पछि एना अंदर अपने हम मैं कहू ना कहीं नहीं जाइए अपने एना अंदर कहीं थोरू के जानवानो सिखवानो मिलसे एना अंदर से पछि यहां आयो तो पहलू जी आमिर भाई के रात मिला तो मैंने कहा की नोट स्पीक शुरू में मैं बोलवा छू मैं कहो आप आचो हार्ट बीट भाई थी गो डॉक्टर आमिर भाई हाथ में अमार जमात में शू अमार एम है कि डॉक्टर आमिर भाई हाथ में माइक आए पी आम एक हार्ट बीट भी बढ़ी जाए स्ट्रेस लेवल बढ़ी जाए टेन्शन भी बढ़ी जाए खबर नहीं शू था हमें पर मैं एम कहूँ कि घनी घनी अच्छी घनी घनी खूबी एक्सेलंट स्पीच आप शुरू में साथ मैं एम कहू छू कि सगलाज अपने पहला तो एस बी आई में आप लोग का सगला जे एना बोर्ड ना उपर छो सगला जे स्पीकर्स हो जे सगला बोला एना अंदर सगला प्रेजेंटेशन था एक्सट्रीमली इन्फॉर्मेटिव था अने मैं कहू छू मैं तो नॉट एज अ फिजिशियन बट बीइंग अ नॉन फिजिशियन मैं कहू छू कि जे सगला इश्यूज होना बारा में आप लोग का सगला जे बात की थी घना इम्पोर्टंट इश्यूज हो घना अपना कम्युनिटी अंदर घना की इम्पोर्टंट इश्यूज हो अने आज अपना डॉक्टर्सों पास एक एक घनी मोटी चीज है कि आप लोग का सगला ने एक पहलू चीज मुबारक बने आप पूछो कि मौलाना ने आका मौला अपना सैयद ना अली कदर मुफद्दल सैफुद्दीन आका पहले तो अपने दुआ करिए जब अपने हर सास से दुआ करिए जब अपना मौला अपना बाबा शफीक ने उमर शरीफ ने तारोज क्यामत लग दराज ने दराज कर जो अने ये दुआ न साटे एम भी दुआ करिए कि वो दिन घनों ने घनों जल्दी नसीब था कि मौला यहाँ नॉर्थ अमेरिका पढ़ा रहे अने जे एम भी दुआ करे साथ है कि आ वर्ष एम अपनी जो सगला उम्मीद है कि अशारा मुबारक है यहाँ नॉर्थ अमेरिका में थाय ये भी अपने नसीब थाय एना साथ मैं एम कहूँ छू कि आज डॉक्टर्सों ने आप लोग का सगला तरफ यहाँ एक घनो जो मौलाना खास नजारत है यनी बरकत से आज अपना मुमिनीन अंदर भी डॉक्टर्सों वास्ते एक घनो मोटो एक कम्फर्ट जोन है डॉक्टरों तरफ से कई चीज आए थे तो सगला सुने से बीजा कोई कहे तो आम शू कि भाई वारू कर सू आम छो पर डॉक्टर्सों तरफ से आए थे तो एना इम्पोर्टन्स एनु मेग्नेट्यूड घो बेहतर घो ज्यादा आए थे अने चीजन आप लोग ने मैं रिक्वेस्ट करूँ छू कि आ सगला जितली भी पॉइंट्स बात करी अपने जो हिस्ट्री की बात करी कुरानी बात करी पेरेंटिंग बात करी बिजनेस वेपार बात करी सकली अने बीजा घना पॉइंट्स हो सकला अपने तो मैंने पाँच आमिर भाई मां जो रखे टाइम बढ़ी गयो है पर अपने शू है कि आ सगली चीजों आ बढ़ा पॉइंट्स हो आप लोग मिसल पुश कर रहा छो जरूर एने पुश करिए एक मैं एम कहूँ कि सगला पॉइंट घना इम्पोर्टंट है पर मैं कहूँ कि एक चीज जो मैंने हमने मैं एम कहूँ कि जो एक टार्गेट अपने सेट करिए आ वर्ष वास्ते कि जे अपना फर्जंडो है यंगस्टर्स हो जैसे अपना खास सटन जे आ सत्तर वर्ष थी चौबीस वर्ष ना जे जे अपने मदरसा में से निकली जाए अने कॉलेज जावा शुरू करे ए दरमियान अंदर अपना पास इश्यूजों घना है 
अपने सगला डिस्कशन भी थू या मीटिंग में भी थू डॉक्टर साथ भी बात थी है ये चीज़ों से मैंने एम है कि आ एक चीज पर आप लोग एज एज फिजिशियंस एक फोकस लीए कि कि रीत से अपने ये लोग इंटरेक्ट करिए कि रीत से अपने पर वर्क करिए जे ह्यान अने सोसायटी मैं एम नहीं कहूँ ह्यान सोसायटी इश्यूजों से मैं मैं घनी कहूँ छूँ कि मे बी एकदम प्राउड अमेरिकन छू मे बी ह्या जना छू ह्यान मोटो थो छूँ मैंने कोई कहें कि आ वेस्टर्न इश्यू है मैंने घो गुस्सो आए थे कि वेस्टर्न इश्यू कहीं नहीं आ तो दुनिया इश्यू है पर आज मैं एम कहूँ छूँ कि आज जे दुनिया चैलेंजिस दुनिया ने चैलेंजिस एना वास्ते शू है कि आप लोग बेवे फ्रॉम आपू जो पोजिशन है एज अ फिजिशियन अने जे एना अंदर बेवे अपने मेडिकली भी सोशली भी आ सकती चीज़ों पर कि रीत से अपने वर्क करिए कि रीत से अपने आ लोग ने टार्गेट कर अपने जे लोग की मुश्किल है ये कि रीत से अपने हल करिए खास आप लोग का फोकस करजो जरूर पहला खाली सगला बोर्ड और सगला जो फिजिशियन जो सगला आज हाजिर थे सगला मैं भी शुक्रिया कहूँ छूँ कि मैंने भी आज सीखा घूम मिलू जा भी मिलू पहलू चीज तो मैं एक जुजा भाई भी मारे खास दोस्त है अमे रोज बात करें कि जिम में जाऊँ जाए जिम में जाऊँ जाए आज टॉक पे तो अभी पहले ले जाए पहलू चीज जिम में जाइस इनशाला आखिर में बस दुआ करिए कि अपना मौला अपना बाबा शफीक आका मौला सैयद ने अली कदर मुफदल सैफुद्दीन आकानी उमर शरीफ ने रोज क्यामत लग दराज और दराज करजो अने अपने सास की जिंदगी बात करिए तो आने अंदर अपने एम दुआ करिए कि अपनी आखिर सास तक मौला की खिदमत करता रहिए मौला पर फिदा ठाता रहिए अरे मौला की खुशी हासिल करता रहिए आमीन आमीन अरे साहब वंस अगेन वी थैंक यू फॉर योर सपोर्ट एंड गाइडेंस एंड लीडरशिप एंड एंड बीइंग हियर एंड प्रेजेंट मींस द वर्ल्ड टू अस अ कपल ऑफ लास्ट हाउस कीपिंग अनाउंसमेंट्स एंड आई विल टर्न ओवर टू आवर वाइस प्रेसिडेंट डॉक्टर शबर भाई साहब uh number 1 to obtain cme credit credit you must fill out the pre and post evaluations please do so number 2 each and every talk we have had some amazing talks and we understand that some of them were concurrent so everybody missed some uh each and every talk will be available on our website sbmedical.org uh within the next day or so so please take advantage of those number 3 most important there's lunch outside <laughs> so do you leave here please make sure to grab lunch and it will be in a to go uh to go bag for you and we have uh, yoga mats to help with uh keeping people healthy and stretched uh in the economy zone uh we have yoga mats uh for you to take as parting gifts as well with that i'll turn over to our vice president dr uh, shabir bhai sahab shakar thank you thank you dr amir bhai uh bismillahir rahmanir rahim be wahi be mola ali qadar mola सैयदना अली कदर मुफद्दल सैफुद्दीन मौलानी उम्र शरीफ ने दराज दराज करजो अपने यहाँ जमा थ सगला आया घनी खुशी थी कि सगला पुता टाइम निकाली ने यहाँ जमा थ क्या मौके पर जमा थ सैयदना अब्देली सैफुद्दीन मोइज अजगर इल्म मंबा एना जम उरुसा मौके पर सगला आप जमा थ मौके पर अपने भी यहाँ थोड़ू इल्म पड़ा जितू पढ़ी सकें एटू पड़ा हम आज अपने यहाँ से जाइए छे तो शू साथ लैने जाइए ये नियत करिए कि अपने तबीब छे डॉक्टर छे मौला बुरहानुद्दीन ने अपने सुना छे सगला सुना छे कि मौला फरमावे छे कि तमें डॉक्टर छो तारी बात लोग सुने छे तो ये नियत कर जाइए कि हमें हमारा गाम में जाइए छे तो हमें हमारा मोहिब भाइयों बहनों सगला ने आ सुनावशू कि आ साल सैयदना अली कदर मुफद्दल सैफुद्दीन खुशी अने मंशा छे कि हर मुमिन पोता दुकाने बिजनेसों बंद कर अशरा में बराबर नव दिन शामिल थाय तो ये नियत कर जाइए एज अ डॉक्टर लोगों तारी बात सुन से तमें भी नियत कर सो अने बीजा ने भी साथ लैने आशो मस्जिद में अशारा वाज में आका हुसैन मातम करशो आका हुसैन पर आंसू बहाँ आठ जन्नत कमाशो य तो है 
હવે એ બીજું આપણે શું ફાયદો છે કે વી એઝ અ ફિઝિશિયન હેવ અ લોટ ઓફ ફ્લેક્સિબિલિટી વી આર વી કેન ઇઝીલી સ્ટોપ આવર બિઝનેસીઝ એન્ડ આવર પ્રેક્ટિસીઝ એન્ડ કેટ કવરેજ સો દેર ઇઝ નો પ્રોબ્લેમ ઇન ગેટિંગ ધ ટાઈમ ઓફ બરાબર છે સગલા એવરીબડી અગ્રીઝ વિથ મી ઓર નોટ તો આ નિયત છે આપણે આ સીધી જઈએ આપણા ગામમાં અને કોશિશ કરીએ કે આશારા મુબારકા ચૌદસો ને ફોર્ટી થ્રીના અંદર આપણે સગલા મસ્જિદોમાં મજલીસોમાં અશરાની વાઝમાં મોલાણા સાથે મુમકિન થાય તો ઇમકાન થાય તો મોલાણા સાથે અશરા કરીએ એમ આપણે નિયત કરીએ ખુદા આખા મોલા અલી કદર મોલાની ઉમર શરીફને દરાજ અને દરાજ કરજો અને આ ફાતિમી દાઈ હુસૈનના દાઈના કદમોમાં બેસીને આપણે અશરા સુનવું નસીબ થાય એમ આપણે દુઆ કરીએ છીએ વાલા ખુદ માય કુમાયા બનિલ મુસ્તફા દા બન વન મલ વઝાયફું બેતાઈ દે કુમ નસતી ઓ દર સૌલુ મે કુમ વ તકવા અલ તકવા કોયફુ તૌલહી ઉમર સૈફિન દીને કલઝી આઝમિન ગો રે શૂને અફાની નાબ કાહો રાબુલ અર શેફી કોલ નતિન વ આદાઉ બેનારે જબ હાતો મતુકવા વસલા તો વાઇત રતે હિલોલા હુમ ન મતુલ ઉઝમા હુમુલ ગાયતુલ ખુસવા